Testing, testing. Do I need a motion and a second for it? Um, I, yeah, you might as well get one. Okay. Yeah. Good morning. It is 9.30 on Tuesday, September 20, uh, sorry, August 29th, and I'm calling to order this uh, regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Let's begin with a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Arenas? Here. Supervisor Chavez? Supervisor Simidian? Here. Supervisor Lee? Present. S uh, Vice President, uh, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. President Ellenberg. I am here as well. You Do you want to try Supervisor Chavez again and see if she's joined the Zoom? Supervisor Chavez, are you online? Okay, well, we have a quorum. So when she joins us, um, do let me know because we have to include some language around uh, remote participation. And in the meantime, I will turn to Supervisor Simidian to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, Supervisor Chavez is to present our invocator um, as well today, but in her absence, give me just a moment here. I believe someone from Supervisor Chavez's team sent um, an email with introductory language, but I am not finding it. So I'm wondering if someone can help me welcome our invocator this morning. Hold on one second, Betty. Thank you, first of all, very much for, for popping up here, but also we couldn't hear you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Venerable Tai Fup Chun of the Luquan Buddhist Cultural Center. Thank you and welcome. Yes, I am just a, a simple monk <laughs> to be here. Thank you for having me here to share with you prayer before the meeting of uh, the Santa Clara County Board of uh, Supervisors. Please take a deep breath and be together in this special prayer. Namo tasa parahato arahato sama samputase. Dear beloved Lord Buddha, enlightenment one, please battle your wisdom upon us so that we may understand the truth about ourselves, the truth about this life, the truth about this world, so that we may see that all human beings 
are the same and equal in that we all want to live, and we all have the right to live. Please show us with your compassion so that we may see, understand, and embrace the difference among us. The difference in our way of thinking, working, and communicating so that we may realize that our differences are like flowers in the garden. This difference have made this garden of American more beautiful and this garden of life more meaningful. We, the people of Santa Clara County, and church our beloved county to the board of sup uh, supervisor to care for and protect so that all residents can be safe, flourish, and reach the full potential. May La Buddha assist our supervisor in meeting the county challenged with the compassion, wisdom, courage, and innovation. May the supervisor remain open hearts so they can hear the voice of those who are suffering even to hear the voice of those who have no voice. May no one bring harm to others. May the hungry be fed, the sick be courteous. May innocent children be healthy and happy. May we be free from all disaster, either natural or man-made. May all beings live in peace and harmony. My last word, please allow me to say special thanks to Supervisor Cindy Chavez for her decade of public service to the county and her vision and support in guiding us to build a beautiful Buddhist temple in Morgan Hill to serve residents in District 1, Santa Clara County and beyond. It is still under construction when it's done, I would like to invite all the county supervisors to attend the grand opening ceremony to cut the ribbon of our temple called Meta Tamtu Buddhist Heritage Garden. Thank you. Thank you. We have a number of adjournments in memoriam uh, today, and I'm going to begin uh, the first one, item 4A, for Sh Rochelle. Um, fondly called Shelley McNamara. Shelley McNamara passed away peacefully at age 86 in the San Jose home where she lived for 47 years. She was an active member of the community and led several nonprofit organizations in the area. Shelley served proudly and with integrity as executive director of the Santa Clara County Bar Association Law Foundation and as executive director of the Diabetes Society of Santa Clara Valley. She advocated for youth throughout her career and took great pride in the Diabetes Society's annual summer camp for children with diabetes that was held in the Santa Cruz Mountains and for the Law Foundation's work on behalf of abused and neglected children. Shelley was nominated three times for the Santa Clara County Woman of Achievement Award and was one of the first women members of the San Jose Rotary Club, in which she participated for more than 30 years. She also served on the Santa Clara County Civil Grand Jury and tutored Learning Challenge students at Washington Elementary School in the San Jose Unified School District. Shelley was proud of and inspired by the courage of her Jewish immigrant grandparents, all four of whom fled Russia and Eastern Europe to avoid the perils of the Holocaust. Shelley was born and mostly raised in Brooklyn, New York City, where she completed high school in three years. She won a scholarship to Barnard College and was a proud Barnard alum, as am I, holding appreciation and gratitude for the opportunity the school gave her all her life. Shelley and I met through Rotary and quickly bonded over our love for our shared alma mater, our commitment to children's well-being, and our love for San Jose. 
She was deeply supportive of my efforts to serve in public office and often sent kind and encouraging emails acknowledging and appreciating my work both as a school board member and a supervisor. Shelley is survived by her beloved big brother, Herb Wall, and beloved sister-in-law and friend, Arlene Wall. She was predeceased by her former spouse, Joseph McNamara, who served as chief of police for San Jose PD from 1976 through 1991, and is survived by their children, Donald McNamara, Lauren Watson, and Kara Mc McNamara Rust, married to Paul, who are some of my favorite neighbors, as well as grandchildren, Matthew, Dexter, Gabrielle, and Ethan. May Shelley's family find comfort in one another, and may her memory always be for a blessing. I'd like to invite up Karen and Paul um, to say a few words if they'd like. And thank you again for allowing me to, to offer this tribute to your mom. Thank you to Susan and the Santa Clara Board of Supervisors for dedicating this meeting to my mother, Shelley McNamara, and for inviting me and my husband, Paul, here to join you today. It makes me even prouder of my mom than I was already for living her life in such a great way that she's being recognized publicly like this. I know she had great respect uh, for all of you and the selfless work that you do. My mom had so many ties to this great community over the 47 years she lived in this valley, in the same house in Willow Glen the entire time. She, like all of you, dedicated her working life to helping others, whether it be as the executive director of the Diabetes Society of Santa Clara Valley or um, the executive director of the Law Foundation or in the countless hours that she spent volunteering during and after she retired. When she first got out of college, as a woman, the only job that she was able to secure was as a secretary. But with her strong leadership abilities, uh, she was able to get increasingly responsible positions, and she helped to chart the path for women who followed her to be recognized on their merits and not just their gender. Thank you so much for dedicating this meeting to my mom, who not only was a groundbreaker for women in the workforce, but a loving mom and grandma as well. And that's how I will remember her most. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing. And I just wanted to say, I'm gonna miss my grandmother. I think about her, or no, my uh, mother-in-law, I should say. And uh, I think about her a lot. And uh, thank you so much for uh, having uh, us here today. Thank Thanks, you. Paul. We have two additional adjournments this morning that are going to be presented by Supervisor Lee in honor and memory of Correctional Deputy Arturo Romero and Correctional Officer Troy Reynolds. Thank you, President Ellenberg. The next two Germans, unfortunately, are both from our own sheriff's office. First, I actually would like to thank Sheriff Johnson and the staff for being here today and also being at the services, lining up to pay the respects, supporting families during these very difficult times. So it is with great sadness that we join today in the honor and memory of Correctional Deputy Arturo Romero and Correctional Officer Troy Reynolds. I'll say a few words first and then ask to see if anyone from the families or the sheriff's office would like to say a few words. Correctional Deputy Romero began his career with the Department of Correction back on April 5, 1999. He was assigned to the main jail where he completed his formal training program. He remained at the main jail until January 2006 when he was transferred to the Elmwood facility. During his tenure in the facilities, Deputy Romero was a member of the emergency response teams, a gun bearer, and of course his most important role, a comedian of sorts. During his services, I learned that Deputy Romero always brought laughter to the department as a huge personality and also a faithful Dallas Cowboy fans and explained why there are so many blue and silver stars worn by so many during his service. 
He's survived by his wife, Jean, his son, Joshua, daughters, Juliana, Sophia, Mila, and his sister, Diana. And his beloved family members are here today. And I just want to acknowledge them. Would you please rise? And if you would like to say a few words, you could come up. No? Okay. All right. No worries. Thank you for being here. And for Correctional Officer Richard Troy Reynolds, he served the department as a correctional officer for 26 years, in which he was assigned to numerous positions throughout Elmwood, Main Jail, and the CCW. Officer Reynolds always made himself available and will step in to support his team in various positions, including 8A training officer, gun bearer, and the ERT. Officer Reynolds was very knowledgeable and was always willing to help others that needs help. He enjoyed craftsmanship to include making various wood projects around the house. He was also a huge sports fan and loved the Oakland Raiders, San Francisco Giants, Golden State Warriors, and the San Jose Sharks. He loved spending time with the family and being with them as they participate in so many different things in the community. He survived by his wife of 10 years, Andrea. They had three children together, Jackson, Scarlett, the clan, Andrea's daughter, Adriana, son, Noah, and Troy's daughter, Tiffany. Troy also had two sisters, Christy and Libby, and a few of the members are also here today. And I'd also like to ask them to rise and be acknowledged. <laughs> and if you would like to come and say a few words. Good morning. Good morning. I am Andrea Reynolds, the wife of Officer Reynolds. On behalf of my children and myself, we would like to thank the Board of Supervisors for honoring their father this morning. Thank you to the Sheriff's Office, Sheriff Johnson, under Sheriff Bender for all of their support. A special thank you to the community for the outpour of support and prayers. Troy was very proud to serve and protect his community for 26 and a half years. He loved his job and he loved his work family. We miss him dearly. He was a wonderful husband and father. I end this with a reminder to each of you to hug your loved ones tonight. Thank you. Such tragic losses for, for families. May, may their memories be for a blessing and wishes for so much strength and, and support from their, their communities of loved ones. Our next item is 5A, uh, a commendation uh, for Ed Solis. Um, Supervisor Arenas, are you ready for that one? Not yet? Okay. Not a problem. We are going to move down then to a presentation for, you got it? Hold on. I'm going to, on behalf of Supervisor Chavez, who is unable to be with us today, I am going to present the commendation uh, on which she led in honor of the absolutely wonderful uh, and iconic Irene Chavez. And are you here, Irene? Excellent, I'm gonna come up and do it. Well, I'm sorry my colleague is not here. I'm also really delighted that, that I get to do this for you, Irene. It is my great honor to recognize and commend Irene Chavez, whose work has significantly shaped healthcare across Santa Clara County and well beyond. Born and raised in Texas in a family of eight, 
Irene Chavez graduated from the University of Texas at El Paso with a degree in political science, initially intending to become a high school gov government teacher. Irene shifted her career focus to healthcare after working night shifts in a hospital during her college years. She rose through the ranks to become the CEO of the Hospitals of Providence Memorial Campus, a 500 bed hospital in El Paseo, Texas. In 2001, Irene moved to Santa Clara County, yay, to serve as the senior vice president and area manager for Kaiser Permanente, overseeing a staff of more than 3,000 individuals that serve 260,000 patients in Santa Clara and Santa Cruz counties. Under Irene's leadership, Kaiser Permanente has been recognized with numerous awards, including the American Heart Association Gold Plus designation, the Target Stroke Honor Roll Elite Plus Award, and the J.D. Powers Highest Rated Health Plan, among others. In 2015, Irene was honored by her alma mater, the University of Texas at El Paso, with its Gold Nugget Award, oh, that's so Texas, <laughs> recognizing her exceptional contributions to her professions and her community. Irene has maintained a deep connection to Santa Clara County continually striving to improve healthcare services for our residents and setting a high standard for healthcare providers across the nation. Thank you, Irene, for your tireless, tireless efforts and for inspiring all of us. So I'm going to say a few words and then I'll yes. hand you the proclamation thank and we'll you. do a photo. I'll well, get. thank you so much, uh, County Supervisors. I am touched, um, and I'll tell you that one doesn't um, deserve something like this unless you're supported by an amazing team. And my team is awesome, um, whether it's the chief nurse or the chief operating officer. We also don't get to where we are without stressing how important it is that we be held accountable. And some of the people behind me um, especially Supervisor Sabidian, uh, pushed and pushed to make sure that we stood up and did the right thing all the time. These are difficult jobs, um, as are the jobs in healthcare. And I've been in healthcare since 1975, way before some of you were born. And I've seen the changes. And we've gone through Ebola, we've gone through SARS, we're going through COVID still. And it isn't without partnerships that success can't be achieved. So I thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg. I thank Supervisor Chavez. Um, this is for the team of folks that deliver care. And thank you, Paul, for um, being here and waving. Um, you have an amazing CEO for Valley uh, Medical Center. He does awesome work, as does his team. So thank you so much. We're going to turn our backs to you for a quick moment and take a picture. That's for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia. You look wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Beautiful. We are um, going to move now to our second ceremonial presentation uh, that will be presented to Ed Solis by Supervisor Silvia Arenas.
It is really my honor um, to uplift the achievements of a dear friend upon his retirement. And I'm going to ask Ed to, to come up here with me. And while he does that, I'm just going to recognize a couple of folks that have, are here from the city of San Jose in support of Ed and Brian Clampett, um, Anthony Macias, Jairo Ramirez, Victoria Lopez, and of course, uh, Jim Reber from our, uh, the city of San Jose's Parks Foundation. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> Ed, you're one of the most tenacious, funny, loving, and just hardworking people that I've gotten to know for more than 20 years. You not only know me, but you know my family. And, and that, to me, is, is really meaningful because you've been not only helpful to me and supportive of me, but you've done the same of my sisters, and I just, I, I really love you for it. We met um, about 20 years ago at 99 Notre Dame um, when we were both in the youth intervention uh, services. Um, and, uh, and this really, truly feels like full circle. Um, in this moment, I get to honor you and recognize your career um, and dedication to public service. So to me, it's just absolutely wonderful that I get to have this, this honor. I'm going to talk a little bit about Ed, because Ed um, is many things. Um, one of those things is was a, a recreation superintendent, um, but he also um, was just so much more, a coach and a jiu-jitsu world champion, um, a designer, very creative with, with t-shirts and design. Um, he also really established and created paths for others to come in into the city of San Jose and provide public service in a very meaningful way. But one of the things, and, I, and I've got to say this, Ed, that one of the things that, um, that I think really um, crowns your career is Viva Calles. Not, not to put everything else aside, because I think the work that you did with our youth was very meaningful. Um, but I'm going to tell you, this gentleman here talked to us electeds about closing, how many miles, 16? Six to seven. Six to seven miles of the city of San Jose. Um, closing down these streets meant closing down pathways for our businesses. And as you know, the city of San Jose, we are more uh, of a car um, riding uh, experience here. Um, and he really transformed our city into a play streets, uh, the king of open streets. And um, he gave us an opportunity to really see the city of San Jose in a way that we don't get to see it every day as we drive past it. And probably don't even notice that small cleaners um, in the corner, or we don't get to really see that there's a pastry shop, or maybe something that we really needed um, in one of those curio shops and boutiques um, that have so many things that just really attract us. Um, you allowed us to experience joy and laughter um, and really get to fall in love with the city of San Jose all over again, and I just am so grateful for that. With that, you, it reminded me of, of a phrase, um, when I think about what your service has been to the city of San Jose. Because you, having Viva Calles, you brought in another economic engine to our city. And you gave life to some parts of our city that were just really run down. And people now celebrated four times a year. And I just absolutely love the, this transformation that you did. And it reminded me of a, of a phrase that, that um, I think about a lot with Mother Teresa. I know this is strange. I'm going to talk about Mother Teresa. And you, but, but it's 
Prayer in action is love, and love in, a love in action is service. And the service that you've provided, I couldn't be more grateful for. I wish you the best in your next endeavor. I know that this is not the end. You're just retiring from the city of San Jose, but not, you're, you're not retiring from our community. And so I can't wait to see what you do next. Ed. Um, and I'd love to present a commendation if I had one in front of me. Um, it's behind you, I think. <laughs> On behalf of the county supervisors, I'd love to present you with this commendation. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'm going to turn it over to Ed to say a few words. Thank you. Well, um, as a supervisor at NS mentioned, uh, it's been a long road, and it just seems like yesterday that I got I got to 99 North or 99 Notre Dame, right downtown, and met all the amazing people that uh, became lifelong friends. Of course, the supervisor and her many sisters, the Arena sisters, who um, not only serve in public but police, um, school district administration. They're just an amazing family and just a wonderful testament to their parents' hard work in raising them in San Jose. And so um, I'm just very fortunate. I'm very fortunate to have the opportunity to serve the many people of, of San Jose and, uh, and get to meet people uh, that, again, it's not always easy making friends as an adult. I, I got here when I was in my 30s and, and uh, I just really have made San Jose a, a my home, my second home. And, I love the city. I love everything about our eclectic communities and our diverse cultural uh, population. And uh, it was my honor serving. Thank you so much. All right, we are now uh, moving to the, the business portion of our meeting. We'll begin with item six, which is public comment. This is the opportunity for members of the public wishing to address the board on matters not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors are welcome to do that now. If you're in chambers and you wish to speak, there are yellow cards in the back that you need to fill out and get them to the clerk. I'll give a few minutes if I see more people heading over there. When the first speaker in chambers begins speaking, the queue will close. So if you are planning to speak, please make sure you have that yellow card. If you're on Zoom, please raise your virtual hand. The Zoom queue will close when the first speaker on Zoom begins. And both of those limitations are, regardless of the number of people, happy to have uh, everyone who wants to speak to do so, but for meeting management purposes, um, we do cut the cut the list when the first speakers begin. Curtis, do we have speakers in chambers? We have five speakers in chambers and four currently on Zoom. That is nine uh, speakers altogether. I'm not seeing anybody else come up. More could join on Zoom, so why don't we go with two minutes? I'll note for the Zoom uh, speakers that if we get to more than 15, that's fine, but we'll um, have to move down the public comment to one minute. So our first nine, um, let's uh, call them up, please. Thank you. All right, I'm going to call the in-chamber speakers first. I'm going to call three names, please line up. Our first speaker will be Brian Bertasini, followed by Wes Mukoyama and Paul Soto.
please approach the podium. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Bertasini. I'm a retired cybersecurity and IT audit professional. I have more than 20 years of experience testing information systems and applications for compliance with a number of industry and regulatory requirements and standards. I was the founder and CEO of AppSec Consulting, a San Jose-based consulting firm, leading provider of security testing services to financial services industry. While I was in industry, I maintained a number of cybersecurity and IT audit certifications, professional associations, including AIPCA. I was a member of the FBI's InfraGuard program, which fosters collaboration between law enforcement and industry, and a member of the US Secret Service High Tech Crimes Task Force. I've spent hundreds of hours as a volunteer doing research, learning about federal and state election codes, California voting system standards, Dominion use procedures, National Institute, for standards and technologies, cybersecurity framework for election infrastructure, uniform vote counting procedures, dozens of supplemental documents published by the California Secretary of State. During the past two years, I have observed many of the processes in place at the Registrar of Voters. Observations have included ballot design and layout, vote by mail, envelope receiving and sorting, signature verification, ballot extraction, flattening, ballot duplication, tabulation, adjudication, and a 1% canvas. Other observations have included the programming and testing of vote center equipment, logic and accuracy testing for vote center and vote by mail equipment, and test runs of vote by mail ballot tabulation and adjudication. So why am I here? After hundreds of hours of research, observations, interviews, public records requests, it appears highly likely that the deployed voting systems for both the vote centers and vote by mail ballot processing we're not compliant with the state election code for both the 2022 primary and general elections. Additionally, the ROV has published a document on their public internet site. Thank you. We're ready for the next speaker. Appreciate your time. Good job. Ready. Honorable board members. My name is Wes Mukuyama, LCSW retired and former director of UIKAI Japanese American Community Senior Service and volunteer facilitator of our English speaking family support caregivers group, the longest standing ethnic caregivers provider group in Santa Clara County since 2003. Next to me is Jennifer Masuda, our current executive director of UIKAI. We support the caregiver study proposed by Senior Agenda. When we started our caregivers group, 23% of our population was over 65, far exceeding 13% at that time. 2030 is a projected time for the general population. Proportionally, we have the largest percentage of in-home family caregivers of all ethnic groups exceeding 45%. In-home and continuing family caregiving is one of the most stressful experiences in life, almost matching nurses and disaster care providers in compassion fatigue. Our 70, over 75% of caregivers become depressed at one time or another. We had an experience of a suicide by a caregiver husband in our early days. Researching that caregiver support, research shows that the caregiver support Daycare and socialization nutrition sites are optimal ways to bring quality of life to the isolated elderly, particularly to those with dementia. We urge that the study be funded and that it will be thorough and expedient. We already know that there are many unmet needs of our seniors who are suffering. There are also countless unmet needs burdened on middle class families who have limited resources. Uh, and if I may, uh, I'd like to just say one thing about Joel Wolf. Uh, Thanks, Wes. After Paul Soto, our speakers will be Alan Fong and Mark Trout.
Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Paul Soto, and I'm a descendant of both Mission de la Alcala and Sasi Puedes. August 29th is sacred in El Movimiento Chicano. It was a day the purest forms of Chicanismo y Carnalismo was on full display and at the height of its maturity. The issues were simple. Chicanos were no longer going to stay silent about the fact that we were only 5% of the population in the United States, yet represented 22% of the deaths in Vietnam. We represented 19% of the population of California prisons, 80% dropouts of high school, less than 1% were in university. We held no civil civics positions, and we did the hardest work for the lowest pay. We were being abused, humiliated, violently attacked by school teachers who would punish children if they spoke Spanish. This, the system itself was being reckoned with as, a dis, as its disgusting institutionalized racism and attacked the very citizens who were its victims. Ruben Salazar, a reporter for the Los Angeles Times, highlighted explicitly in his columns the conditions of the Chicano and how it was the system who created such conditions via redlining, substandard education, imprisonment, and disproportionate numbers to their population. On this day, Ruben was murdered, becoming a martyr for the Chicano movement and his people. Some people measure a man by how he died for his people. For myself as a Chicano, descendant of Sasi Puedes and Sanjo Califas, I choose to remember Ruben for how he lived and loved his people so much that he used his education, his skill as a journalist to write our story from our point of view. Que viva Corti Gonzalez, Ruben Salazar, Father Anthony Soto, Sonny Madrid, Jack Brito, Ernestina Garcia, United People Arriba, Confederación de la Raza Unida, y los Mujeres de Aslan, Fred Ross, Dr. Sal Alvarez, Father McDonald, Father Moriarty, Father McEntee, Sofia Mendoza, Consuelo Rodriguez, Los Siete de Betten, Raquel Silva, Teo Morales, Father Reynaldo Flores, and Black Berets de Justicia. Thank you. About a week ago, I went to the Sheriff's Department and filed the official complaint of dereliction of duty on the part of the Sheriff to not confiscate the deadly biological weapons that are called COVID vaccines. I haven't heard back yet, but the ammunition I gave him and I give people to do what I did and follow my shining example is the Karen Kingston Substack. Karen Kingston Substack is the absolutely irrefutably documented proof that the COVID shot is a, a biological weapon designed to kill people. But I have some good news. You should have listened to me at the beginning three or four years ago when I mentioned chlorine dioxide. There is an antidote to the myocarditis that uh, has been developing in, in young people, particularly uh, I think of the Surgeon General in Florida. Uh, I wish we had a good Surgeon General in the rest of these states. And he's even weak because he's not saying everybody should not take the shot, but he had to admit it's not a good idea to take a shot if you're a male from, you know, 18 to 30 because they're dying. But the good news is, is uh, there's this stuff that the communist Chinese have had five years ago. It's the antidote for the COVID shot. And it's called Lipsomol, L-I-P-S-O-M-A-L, artemisinin, and you can get it anywhere. A-R-T-E-M-I-S-I-N-I-N. -I 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 -N. And it works. And the reason why I believe it, no, I, I preach everywhere. I met this girl, this Chinese girl, and she said her son took the shot against her wishes and it, it cured him. In two months, it cured him. He, his arm had turned black after the shot um, and he developed myocarditis, which is, you know, gets progressively worse and worse and worse. And let's take the masks off, okay? There's 20 people in this room they're wearing masks. I mean, this is a joke. The PCR test is a joke. We've been lied to about everything. Alan Fong. Honorable board members. You can just speak into the microphone. It's on the, it's on the, um, Right there, it's the bar. Just oh, okay. speak normally, please. Thank you. Good morning, board members. Uh, my name is Alan Fong. Um, sorry. Uh, I would like to uh, thank the Board of Supervisors and Supervisors Submitian for the opportunity of the appointment to the Sinchu City uh, Sister, uh, Sister County Commission. 
I'm looking forward to bringing some new ideas to this commission. Uh, I've also had the honor and privilege to serve and follow Supervisor Submidian's leadership when he championed our state's education representative for our county. Um, from 1993 to 2014, I was serving uh, as a school board member for the Orchard Elementary School District. So uh, thank you to the Board of Supervisors for your, for your continued uh, public service. And I'm excited to get started with the work on this commission. So thank you. May I say one quick word? Yeah, thank you for the comment. I um, normally don't speak on these comments, but one thing I want to thank my colleagues for uh, recently making some of these appointments to the Central County Commission. Uh, the commission has had quite a few vacancies and weren't able to meet due to quorum measures. So there are still a few more openings. There's my colleague to look at it and please make those appointments soon. Thank you. So that concludes our in-person speakers. We currently have five hands raised in Zoom. Great reminder to everyone on Zoom that when the first person begins speaking, the queue will close. So if anyone beyond the five uh, wish to speak, now is the moment to raise your virtual hands. All right, our first speaker is Lillian Kennig. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. We'll have two yes, minutes can to speak. You hear me? We can, please go ahead. Yes, uh, I just want to commend the board, especially um, Supervisor Lee, Arenas, uh, Ellenberg, um, all of you for uh, your proactive uh, attention, especially in the schools for mental health. For young people, you know, I'm a substitute for San Jose Unified, and I'm back in a classroom again. Um, and, and these issues that come up with the LGBTQT uh, young people in the classrooms, um, even domestic violence with young people. I commend all of you for you know, input, uh, giving monies from um, your fund for all of these important issues. Um, kids are having a rough time. You can see it every day online. And um, I do appreciate that. And the other thing is uh, the, um, the health issue with women, especially in domestic violence and women of color. Uh, again, a commendation you deserve. So uh, I do appreciate that and uh, look forward to seeing some changes done, especially um, up in the upper echelons of the school district in those areas. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Luna. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. President Ellenberg and fellow supervisors, my name is Sharon Luna from the San Martin Neighborhood Association, and I am a board member. SMNA and neighbors of Marie Court sent a letter yesterday to Supervisor Arenas with a copy to you all about the concerns we are facing with for profit mental health facilities being established in limited areas in San Martin. Please note it is not that we are opposed but it is how it is being done. When you have three facilities and six sexual predators all in a mile and a half radius and the want of another one to be installed in a cul-de-sac, it is a concern for hardworking families who only want to be ensured of safety of their families, pets and livestock, along with the biggest investment of their lives, their home. We applaud your efforts to help those with mental health mental illness and drug and alcohol addiction. However, listen to hardworking families that have to cope with what takes place when such facilities move in the area. 44 neighbors met with the owner of the home and the CEO of the company and heard their business model. However, they too were surprised at the amount of facilities in the area and sexual predators. We know that Supervisor Rennes and her staff will meet and partner with us and give us guidance. We will also reach out to our California legislators for they need to change the loopholes regarding for-profit mental health business. Thank you for your time and all that you do. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amit Bindal. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Yeah. Am I audible? Please go ahead. Good morning, board. My name is Amit Bindal. I'm a resident of San Jose, and my aspiration is to provide 
clean, safe, and affordable housing to each and every ag farm worker in the county. Today, I wanna to highlight a critical issue um, that's the plight of the farm worker and the need to encourage private developers to help uh, with farm worker housing. According to the Santa Clara County Agriculture Commissioner's Office, there's an estimated 15,000 farm workers um, in the Santa Clara County, yet approximately 60% of them face challenges accessing safe and affordable housing. Um, um, these farm workers ensure that we have food on our tables. Paradoxically, many of them struggle to find decent housing. Uh, providing them with dignified safe housing isn't just an act of kindness, it's a fundamental recognition of their contribution. Having closely witnessed the hardships of farm worker poverty, I'm deeply passionate about addressing this issue. It's one of the driving forces behind my commitment to farm worker housing. My dream is to provide safe sanitary accommodations to every farm worker in the county. Uh, what makes farm worker housing a, a specially niche area, and it's often overlooked by affordable housing developers, is the set of unique challenges that, that it brings. The dynamics of seasonal work, migrant labor, specific needs of this population that requires. Many affordable housing developers may not have the experience, resources, or will to navigate the intricacies of the system effectively. This is where private developers uh, can bridge the gap. Private developers often encounter significant struggles particularly in the initial stages of the project, uh, obtaining seed funding, navigating the environment, et cetera. Uh, fo focusing county efforts for private developers in this initial phases can have a ripple effect by boosting early stages. We can pay. Thank you. Our next speaker is Delilah. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. Back in April, we informed the board that we are under a vaccine mandate for a vaccine that is no longer available. Per the FDA, the monovalent vaccine is no longer authorized nor available as of April. At the June 21st Health and Hospital Committee, Sarah Cody informed the board that the only vaccine available now is the bivalent vaccine. The monovalent or the one that just covered the original strain is not on the market any longer. These were her exact words. At the August 23rd Health and Hospital Committee, Supervisor Submitian inquired about the employee vaccine mandate, and James Williams informed the board that all the workers, regardless of department they are in, along with new hires, are still under the vaccine mandate for the original vaccine. They are not mandated to get the booster. So again, I ask, how do you have a mandate for a vaccine that doesn't exist? How does this make any sense to the board? Where is labor relations in all this? Where are all the unions? Where is the board? Your silence speaks volumes. You have a vaccine mandate for a vaccine that no longer exists. How is this legal? Please stop the discrimination and the vaccine mandate. The public continues to lose trust in the board because you, you continue to um, ignore these serious matters. Please take action. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aaron. Aaron, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Hello, I'm calling in actually for the same uh, situation. Uh, I've emailed all the Board of Supervisors regarding this issue. Uh, the County of Santa Clara still has many unvaccinated employees technically working under provisional exemptions, whether religious or medical. And as the previous caller stated, those vaccines are no longer available yet. There is now policy via the County Executive that it is still required. Uh, I'd like that question answered uh, as to the validity of the policy and why is there a mandate in place for vaccines that aren't available. For example, even if someone had a change of heart, a change of religion or a medical condition improved and they were able to uh, comply with the county policy, they would not be able to because neither shots are available nor, long, nor are they uh, FDA approved. This is something that I think should be addressed and it's disappointing when only one Board of Supervisors public health aide responded to my email uh, inquiries. I think this is something that needs to be addressed sooner than later. And unlike, uh, and, and as the, the county executive said at the, the meeting, um, the mandate is in place uh, for the future uh, and, and he doesn't see it changing anytime soon. I would ask why, why are you, imposing a mandate in which their shots aren't available and are no longer necessary with such a high rate of vaccination within the uh, those that are employed within the county. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment.
Thank you very much. Uh, item seven is approval of the consent calendar and changes to the Board of Supervisors agenda. Curtis, will you please read the consent calendar as it currently stands? Absolutely. Items on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language on the published agenda. Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. We have a request from President Ellenberg to consider item number 12 after item number 14. Item number 12 is to consider recommendations relating to the Valley Homeless Health Care Program. Item number 14 is to receive quarterly report relating to mental health and substance use as a public health crisis. We have a request from President Ellenberg to add item number 15 to the consent calendar. Item number 15 is to consider recommendations relating to the expansion of school-based behavioral health wellness centers in public school districts. We have a request from Supervisor Arenas to remove item number 96 from the consent calendar to be considered concurrently with item number 18 and a request from President Ellenberg to consider item number 17 and 18 concurrently. Item number 17 is to receive report from the Office of Correction and Law Enforcement Monitoring relating to Office of the Sheriff use of chemical agents in planned use of force incidents. Item number 18 is adoption of ordinance number NS-300.976, amending sections A20-8 and A20-9 of chapter one of division A20 of the county ordinance code relating to adoption of the office of the sheriff's military equipment use policy. Item number 96 is adoption of ordinance number NS-300.977 and ordinance amending sections A22-35 and A22-36 of chapter three of division A22 of the county ordinance code relating to adoption of the office of the district attorney's military equipment use policy. We have a correction to item number 38. The item should read as follows. Approve county sponsorship of Mama D second chance a 501c3 fiscal agent tax ID number 45-3166178 on behalf of NAACP San Jose slash Silicon Valley branch in the amount of $2,650 from the Supervisorial District 2 and Supervisorial District 3 allocations in the Office of the Clerk of the Board of Fiscal Year 2023-2024 budget to support the 68th Annual Freedom Gala. We have a correction to item number 63. The item should read as follows. Approve request for appropriation modification number 50 $3,235,968, increasing revenue and expenditures in the probation department budget relating to the juvenile justice realignment block grant, transferring funds from the 2011 realignment trust fund to the probation department budget and transferring funds to the behavioral health services department budget relating to the addition of various positions. We have a correction to item number 80. The item should read as follows. Accept project as complete and authorize the clerk of the board to execute notice of completion of contract and acceptance of work on contract number 20-31, elevator modernization for 70 West Heading Street and 55 Younger Street project, project number 263-BL18043, contractor Rodan Builders Incorporated. Executive leadership salary ordinance number NS-20.23, Dot zero 02 was approved on first reading on August 15, 2023, and will not be finally approved until it is approved for a second reading, which is agendized to occur at today's meeting under item number 94. Per government code section 54953, the following is an oral summary of the positions for which the proposed salary adjustments are required to be disclosed. NS-20.23.02 provides for a 2% general wage increase to the salary range for the clerk of the board with an effective implementation date of July 10, 2023. The new salary range is set forth in the salary ordinance publicly posted to item number 94. That concludes my list. Thank you very much. I'll look to my colleagues for any uh, additions or further comments on the consent calendar and then a motion to approve. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Madam President. As is my custom, I have a brief announcement, which is uh, that uh, we have been advised that certain items on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act, as indicated in the language in our published agenda. Uh, specifically, uh, today we've been advised that items 24, 25, 26, 28, 30, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 44, 
50, 51, 52, 53, 57, 58, 62, 66, 68, 70, 74, 76, and 81 on the content, consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act. We've also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of our agenda. So I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings as defined by the Levine Act has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any employee of the county council's office or of the clerk of the board's office or any me other member of the county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. With that, I will say thank you and ask the clerk to record me as an abstention. Once again, that is an abstain on item number 32. Abstain on item number 32. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. Uh, Supervisor Lee or Arenas, any additional changes? Go ahead, Supervisor Arenas. I, I'm going to retract my request to hear item 96 after 7 and 18 because I believe 7 and 18 will be deferred to future meeting. Oh, thank you. Not a problem. Thank you. Um, all right. If all of my colleagues have um, made their points, I have a few that I want to go through as well. Um, just by way of, of explanation first, item 12 on, on the Valley Health uh, Homeless um, VHHP <laughs> includes some elements on substance use treatment services that also relate to item 14, which is our broader report on behavioral health services. And it's for that reason that I ask that we hear item 12 after item 14. Uh, with regard to item 15 on the school wellness centers, um, happy for it to be on consent. I want to thank, though, the Office of Children and Families Policy, the Behavioral Health Services Department, and the Valley Health Fand Foundation, all of you, uh, for your excellent work on this project and collaborative effort. I also particularly appreciate the input from the Youth Task Force and was so glad to see that their thoughtful feedback was incorporated into the, into the plan. Uh, related to this work is item 63, which includes $2 million in additional funding for school wellness centers through the Juvenile Justice Realignment Block Grant. Uh, assuming that the board approves that budget item on consent, um, as well as this, it's my understanding that an additional amendment to this agreement with the Valley Health Foundation will need to come forward. I'd like to direct that that amendment come to the board no later than the September 19th meeting so that the request for applications can be announced for the full pool of resources. Uh, item 17 is a report from the Office of Corrections and Law Enforcement Monitoring, also known as OCLEM, on the use of chemical agents in the jails. This report is a response to a request that I made when the board heard item 18, the Sheriff's Military Equipment Use Project in June. The board members received a request yesterday from the Community Corrections and Law Enforcement Monitoring Committee co-chairs to hold items 17 and 18 to allow time for that committee to review the reports and receive input from the community. Given the public concern and attention around this item and the committee's written explanation that they were not offered the opportunity to review OCLEM's report, I will grant the request that these items be held to September 19th. And to ensure that we avoid future delays, I would ask OCLEM to ensure that all reports that are delivered to the board are simultaneously forwarded to CCLEM and that CCLEM members be invited to any and all future town hall meetings that the sheriff's and district attorney's offices hold regarding military equipment use. County Council, has advised that while this item remains under discussion, the Sheriff's Office continues to be authorized to use previously approved equipment and that holding the item impacts only their ability to purchase new equipment. Uh, Mr. Lepresti, can you confirm or correct that, please? That is correct, President Ellenberg. Thank you. Then um, I will, Supervisor Sumidian made a motion. And who seconded? You did not make you a motion, not. Madam Chair. Did anyone make a motion? 
I will make a motion. <laughs> so my, my motion to approve the, the consent calendar um, uh, should include um, the hold of items 17 and 18 to September 19th. I would also like to abstain on item 32, which is the executive salary ordinance flat rate adjustment for the district attorney, assessor, and sheriff. Item 47 is a report on county sponsorships, which was initiated by uh, one of my prior referrals. I wanna thank administration for your engagement on this, as well as the overall willingness to continually evaluate how we work together and identify opportunities for process improvement. I appreciate seeing the report, the information in the re pre presented collectively in an annual uh, report. And, and truly, it brought me joy to see the list of community organizations and events that received sponsorship support from one or more board offices, as well as the Office of the County Executive. All of these organizations contribute to the greater goals of our county, and I think that it's a privilege for us to be able to support that work. I look forward to continuing to collaborate on processes that increase transparency and highlight the work being done by our community-based partners. Item 78 is a project for radiology equipment at uh, O'Connor Hospital. I will vote to approve the project today and want to note that I, I visited our VMC radiology department in June and do have some concerns about the equipment status, staffing, and patient access to appointments. Uh, I'm aware that this is an issue that Supervisor Simidian has also uh, flagged at HHC and I will look forward to monitoring how he advances these discussions in that committee. Uh, that is all and I will ask for a, a second. second. President Ellenberg, if I may. Yes, sir, please. Um, I just want to advise the board that on item number 32, there will not be the requisite three votes for that item to pass since there are two abstentions and one uh, board member absent. Uh, it can be held until the next meeting if that's the preference of the board. I see nods. That's the preference of the board to hold that. Thank you. Do we have public comment on consent? We do. Uh, we have uh, two speakers on item seven, as well as two speakers for 15, which has been proposed to be added to consent. And Madam Chair, forgive me, before we hear from the speakers, I just want to clarify the status of your motion. Um, I understood you to say that items 17 and 18 would be held until what date again? Until September 19th, per the request of the CCLEM co-chairs. Thank you. And mm -hmm. then, um, there was a related item that I think Supervisor Arenas referenced from the consent calendar, which was an ordinance. It, it, I was just coupling items 17, 18, and 96 together, but since President Ellenberg is deferring until September 19th, there was no, it doesn't make sense to couple them. That's all. So we'll keep the, the consent item on the consent calendar? I'm fine with that, yeah. Okay. Thank you. That Thank was you. the clarity I was looking for is what, what, what was the state of play, for lack of a better phrase, on item number 96. If it's still there, it's still there. Good to know. And I think that answers my questions. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. And, and again, um, let us know how many speakers we have in chambers and on Zoom, please. So we have four speakers in chambers, currently one speaker on Zoom. Let's do two minutes, and please note if you're planning to speak, you should have a yellow card in already. I don't see anybody dashing over to the table, so let's take the, the four speakers in chambers, please, two minutes. All right, our speakers in chambers, I'm going to call all four names, please. Um, actually, I one of these speakers is the same speaker on seven and 15. We have three speakers in You're chambers. a little bit muffled, Curtis, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, apologies, I just realized one of the uh, speakers on 15 is also turned in a card for seven. So we have three speakers in chambers and uh, one on Zoom. Thank you, there's one opportunity to speak collectively on all of the consent items, thank you. All right, so our in-chamber uh, speakers are Paul Soto, Wes Mukoyama, and John Sweeney. Give me just one moment. Uh, 
Oh, 14 is on the consent, correct? Just looking for clarification. Uh, I, I was a bit 15 confused. Is 15 is on consent? Yes. Okay, well, I'll talk about uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, Behavioral Health Services Department, while an attendance at this particular meeting to advocate on behalf of my community yesterday, um, I was arrested. I was placed in handcuffs, and it was probably one of the most embarrassing, humiliating, scary experiences that I've had. And I, and I, th my sole purpose for being there was to simply advocate because this is under the heading of behavioral health services. And so it was a committee meeting, and I was asked to leave, and I said, no, I'm not going to leave because I didn't violate the law. So there's no reason why you and I should, like, interact. And this, <clears throat> there's cause for suspicion of crime. So I sat, completed what it ever, what, uh, the business that I had there, and then I walked out. And when I walked out, I was, I was forcefully attacked by two officers. And they went and they were, they were threatening my safety, and I had done nothing wrong. Then they proceeded to put me in handcuffs, and I sat there, and, and, and people are walking out, and I was just completely humiliated. So I'm putting on record that I would like uh, to county council. I want, the, I want the videotapes. I want the videotape of that incident, okay, because I'm, I'm going to file a lawsuit. We can, I've been, there's been five attempts to arrest me, and not one attempt has been successful. And one of them is by you, County, county uh, uh, Supervisor Allenberg. You tried to have me arrested at Conexion. You tried to do that, okay, and you embarrassed me in front of my community. Okay, we can no longer be quiet and silent about let's arrest Paul Soto or let's put him in a position to where the officers could possibly fear for their safety because he's such a dangerous human being and then have justifiable homicide. They pull out the weapons and they kill me. And then you put me and slander me all over the newspapers and saying, look at his background. Look at what kind of a criminal history is. He deserved to die. I'm going to be filing a lawsuit and county council, I want that video. Thank you. Uh, Wes, as you come up, um, please come up. I uh, just wanted to note, I believe you spoke on item number 15 during the public comments, so you're welcome to speak on any other item. I'm just making a, a general comment, no, nothing to do with the consent. Uh, this is just to confirm, Wes, this, this period of time is for items on the consent calendar, so any of the items on the consent calendar other than 15 which you spoke about in public comment, we would be delighted to hear. Thank you. I would just like to take a minute. I, I, I wouldn't wanted to say it during public presentation uh, to Supervisor Simeon. Uh, if I may, I would like to offer my belated condolences to the passing of Joel Wolf, who was a friend and colleague when we served on the Behavioral Health Board uh, older adults committee, and we were co-chairs. His Vietnam experience, his incarceration, his uh, mental health problems, his street work, and his PhD counseling, caring for his father, all lent authenticity, expertise, humor, sincerity, ad, and advocacy, and unmatch, unmatchable legacy. I was privileged to know him and know he will be missed. Thank you. John Sweeney. Uh, good morning, I'm speaking on item 15. On behalf of the County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Marianne Dewan, I want to thank the board for including funding to address the student mental health crisis through the evidence-based practice of school-based wellness centers. As the RFA for student wellness center funding is developed, we offer to partner and share our expertise to ensure that this opportunity is equitable to all districts. We have often seen that smaller and less resource districts do not have the capacity or expertise to apply for these types of grants alone, even though they are sorely needed. We request that staff work to include technical assistance funding and allow consortiums of schools to apply. As we know from firsthand experience, 
launching a student wellness center that complies with education code can be very complicated. And building out Medi-Cal billing and fiscal sustainability plans for each school requires unique expertise in both school-based and managed care billing systems. The county office remains committed to this work and is happy to partner to identify ways to ensure that schools who receive this funding can successfully and quickly launch student wellness centers that meet the crisis needs of students. Thank you for your leadership, partnership, and commitment to expansion of school-based behavioral health services and wellness centers on school campuses. That concludes our in-person uh, speakers. We currently have two hands raised in Zoom. Reminding folks on Zoom that if you're intending to speak on the consent calendar, now is the time to raise your hand when the first speaker, when the first speaker begins, the queue will close. All right, looks like we have three. So our first speaker is Aram James. Aram, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. And uh, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, thank you very much for putting item 17 over because there's a lot more that we need to, to consider. Um, I did read the 45-page uh, the rep uh, report last night put out by uh, OIR and Auckland, uh, and a couple of things stick out, and I, maybe we can correct this before the, the 17th of September. There is no uh, racial demographics on the 17 uh, individual cases, and I think that's a, an oversight uh, because I know that uh, black and brown people are often uh, diagnosed as being mentally ill uh, inappropriately and so then subject to the indignities of the of the uh, criminal justice system. So that's one thing. Secondly, when I look at the mission of uh, Auckland, it says regularly communicating with the public, the board of supervisors, the sheriff, the DA, and the public defenders. That's from Office of the Correction and Law Enforcement Monitoring Establishment and Purpose. Um, I didn't see any attempt to interview those people that were actually gassed, that were the victims uh, of uh, this uh, horrible indignity that occurred in, in these cases. So I'd like to see the report uh, supplemented in that regard. Um, also, um, where is the public defender? You'll note in some of the uh, information that's been sent and circulated regarding other counties, it's not unusual to have the attorneys for people that are potentially going to be gassed to come up and speak with them, to speak with the people that, that they're trying to get compliance from before anybody is gassed. And, you know, I worked on the LPS calendar uh, for when I was a public defender, um, the Landerman Petra Short Act, where we go into the facilities. And I think it's critical to have the public defender's office involved in this as well. They have a very, very good mental health unit, and they need to be involved in this issue. Thank you. Our next speaker is Blair Beekman. Blair, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute, and you have two minutes to speak. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. I wanted to speak on item 50, considering recommendations relative to revenue agreement with the City of San Jose for housing services for at-risk homeless or experiencing homelessness. Um, thanks for this item. I, last week, uh, was very interested in how uh, I've been learning since last week uh, at uh, one of your committee meetings that uh, you're really doing some important work with mental health issues and uh, in how mental health services relates to homeless uh, issues. Um, just to thank you. Uh, I think you know, you have a lot to balance in, in new uh, mental health questions and around homelessness issues that we want to address things uh, sooner than later. And then it's important to address things at, with issues that are needed to address immediately and how people can receive services now. And uh, again, uh, in terms of a mental health component of, of homelessness issues and how we address those things, um, I think you're doing some really interesting work. It's been difficult work to try to parse and better understand, and I think you're, you're accomplishing important goals. Uh, that is balancing uh, human rights concerns and needs that people may need uh, uh, specialized treatment. And how to balance that is difficult. Man, I think you guys are really working and doing it. Thank you again. And uh, hopefully I can talk more about this item in the future. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you. Our next speaker is Walter Wilson. Walter, I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. Good morning, President Ellenberg, Board of Supervisors. Thank you for this opportunity. And uh, thank you for also putting item 17 over to give the community an opportunity to weigh in. You know, one of the important things that people should understand is that when we reviewed these military weapons lists with the Sheriff's Office, and we did so extensively, we were never led to understand that this gas that's being used in the prisons or in the jails were going to be used individually. We were always led to believe that it's going to be used in riot type situations. This is alarming to us, and this is um, um, an eye opener. And quite frankly, we think that the community should have a right to really weigh in on this because this is a very different scenario than we were led to believe. And I think the public should be fully aware of that. Um, also, in any case, when the, the sheriff's office, the DA, or anyone says that they have a, a town hall meeting on these important issues, life and death issues, and no one shows up, it says something about their process. And we think that it should be a prerequisite that they reach out to CCLDM because we will get the community there they saw in the uh, meeting last week on, on, uh, on tasers. So um, thank you very much for moving this item and we'll make sure the community has an opportunity to weigh in before the 19th. Thank you again, have a great day. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Let's vote on the consent calendar. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Passes four to zero. Thank you very much. Um, item eight is time certain not to be heard before 10 o'clock. That's not a problem. It is 10.50. Um, this item is um, an informational item that I've added to the agenda at the request of Caltrans to provide an update on State Route 87 Roadway Real Rehabilitation Project. Um, just want to make, make clear to the public that though they are presenting here, this is a fully uh, state-funded and run program. The opportunity for them to provide an update here is for education purposes, so thank you. Do we have the presenters? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Aslan. Francis, are you on Francis? You can unmute Francis, go ahead. We can see the slides and we can hear you, so please go ahead. Yeah, Francis, go ahead. Okay. Well, yeah. uh, Scott, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Um, might be having some uh, audio difficulties. Okay. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us. I'm Scott McCrank, the Area Construction Manager for Caltrans. Uh, with me is Pedro Quintana uh, from Public Affairs. He's controlling the screen. We also have Victor Gauthier, our Public Information Officer for the project. So we're here to present uh, the Highway 87 project uh, specifically, uh, 56 hour closures that we're proposing to do that, that we plan to do in September and October this month, or of this year. So please go for it, Pedro. So here's a general project overview, uh, kind of high level. So if you look at the map on the right, in red is the project limit. So it does run primarily from 85 in the south, uh, and it runs all the way past 280 uh, into downtown, and it ends at Julian Street. Uh, in downtown San Jose. Uh, the construction began last month and construction is likely to end uh, sometime in early 2025. Uh, the total project funding is just under $70 million. Next slide, please. So here's just the overall uh, project scope uh, for the whole job. Uh, it does replace uh, the roadway pavement with a 20 year life cycle uh, pavement structure. Uh, so that's kind of the primary uh, scope of the project is to upgrade the pavement. Uh, other uh, facets of the job, uh, we do have uh, 28 curb ramps at six intersections that get upgraded. Uh, we will resurface approximately three miles of class one bikeway that runs parallel uh, to 87. 
And then some other things we do, we enhance the corridor safety by replacing the median guardrail between the freeway and the VTA's infrastructure and the median. And we will upgrade guardrails. Uh, also, uh, at the end of the job, we'll have enhanced wet and night visibility striping, uh, which is a great safety improvement. And then we'll also upgrade uh, some drainage facilities uh, within the project limits. Next slide, please. So uh, again, as the construction area manager, uh, I'll talk about the specific aspect that we wanted to present here, which was the highway, uh, full highway closure. Uh, utilizing these highway uh, full closures, we'll be able to perform a significant amount of the paving uh, under these full closures. Uh, so we're planning to do two separate weekend closures, uh, 56 hours in duration. Uh, it's important to note that only one direction of 87 will be closed at at a time. So each weekend it'll be, one weekend will be northbound, the second weekend would be southbound. Uh, the closures run between 280 in the north and 85 in the south. Uh, so those are kind of, that's the, the limits of it. Uh, so it doesn't go all the way to Julian, but it's between the two interchanges. So essentially 280, 87 in the north, 85, 87 in the south. That's where the closures, uh, the closure uh, distance will be. Uh, so again, two separate weekends, uh, only one direction at a time. So uh, it has been planned for northbound to be closed the first weekend. Uh, it would start at 9 p.m. on a Friday, which is September 22nd, and it would reopen Monday morning, September 25th at 5 a.m. And that again is a duration of 56 hours. Uh, so then the second weekend would be approximately, I think it's four weeks later. Uh, so weekend two would be the southbound closure, which would also start 9 p.m., but this would be Friday, October 20th, and again, reopen Monday morning at 5 a.m. Uh, which would be October 22nd. So go ahead. Uh, for the full highway closure benefits. So obviously at Caltrans, we, we want to maximize safety. So to maximize safety, uh, minimizing worker exposure to traffic uh, is very important. So one of the things by doing this with the full highway closure is we don't need to shift as much of the removal barrier that was originally planned. Uh, to do this work. So that would eliminate a lot of, of uh, worker exposure to traffic and which obviously increases safety of the public and safety of the workers as well. And, and by doing this work uh, in an expedited fashion on a weekend, on two, two weekends, we would potentially save three months off the overall schedule. And also doing these closures in, in a 56 hour duration twice, that would reduce the overall nighttime lane closures and nighttime work that the job uh, would have. Uh, with that said, we still do have a lot of night work, but it does reduce the amount of night work needed over the next couple of years. Uh, it also, another important aspect is it does improve the pavement quality uh, prior to winter 2023. Uh, so definitely, you know, you don't want potholes and things developing uh, during the winter. So this will give a good riding surface as we approach the winter months of this year. And in general, uh, this will re result in an overall cost savings for the project. Next slide, please. So as obviously with the closure of this nature, we need to have a traffic management plan. Uh, so we will deploy or we will use the regional changeable message signs. So CMS is what you see. Uh, if you look at the picture on the right, there is a sign that is in the VTA uh, area Actually, I guess it's not the VT area, but it looks like it is. It's on the right-hand shoulder near that orange sign. It's I call it the amber alert sign. So you may see amber alerts on it. Those signs will be uh, installed or will be used to let the public know that the, these closures will be happening. Uh, obviously, we have detours, which I'll get to in the, in the subsequent slides. And then we'll also talk about the outreach effort as well in subsequent slides. Next slide. So uh, in addition to the changeable message signs, which are those overhead ones, we also have the portable changeable message signs. Uh, so that's PCMS. And this slide here has been circulated to the uh, county staff. Uh, so they're aware of kind of the outreach that we're using those message boards for. And, and the idea here is to install these message boards prior, three weeks prior to the closure. So we're looking at the end of this week, we should start seeing these boards going out into the city to let the public know that Various ramps will be closed and, and the freeway will, or the highway will be closed as well. Uh, so this is just kind of an informational slide here of, of the various uh, locations and, and, and points that we think are important for the public to, to view the message. So next slide, please. So obviously when you're closing uh, a major route, 
you'll have detours. So here are the regional detours that we are proposing to use. So uh, the red shows the northbound closure, again, between 85 in the south to 280 in the north. Uh, there's various detours using 85 on the southern end and then kind of running parallel to 87, you could use 101 to the east or seven, Route 17 to the west. And then to get you back to 87, if you're trying to get from one point of 87 to the other, uh, you could use 280 uh, to reach downtown as well. So that's kind of the northbound closure. If you go to the next slide, that'll be the southbound, which essentially is the reverse using the same routes, but going the opposite direction because now southbound is closed the second weekend. Uh, so again, 280s is your detour on the northern end, and then you're using 101 to the east to go in the southerly direction, 17 as well in the west to go in the southern direction. And then 85, uh, well, if you were trying to get back to the other end of the closure at 87, you could use route 85. So that's the detours there. Uh, next slide, please. So obviously there's considerations that, that we, you know, that we had to consider. So uh, impacts the regional uh, detour routes. So route 17, 280, 85, 101, the routes we talked about, uh, our operation staff has determined that based on the traffic, uh, those, those uh, alternate routes or detour routes can handle the additional traffic that they'll see. Uh, it is important to note that we're not planning to close any through lanes on any city or county roads. So those will remain open. Uh, impact the city of San Jose and obviously the county due to ramp closures and detour traffic obviously have to be accounted for. Uh, we did look at points of interest that are in the area. Uh, so obviously San Jose International Airport, SAP Center, Levi Stadium, and then just downtown, uh, downtown San Jose in general. And then we also had to consider in choosing the weekend, the, the two weekends, we had to consider other closures around District 4, which is the Caltrans District 4. Uh, which encompasses the nine Bay Area counties. Uh, with that said, I'll turn that over to Victor Gauthier uh, for our outreach on the next slide. Go ahead, Victor. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, thank you all for having us. Uh, my name is Victor, Victor Gauthier. I'm the Public Information Officer with Caltrans Bay Area for Santa Clara County. Um, and like Scott mentioned, we have already begun our outreach efforts, which include um, presenting at meetings such as this with the Board of Supervisors, as well as with the city council meetings, as, um, as well as with the city of San Jose. Uh, we've also begun um, administering our uh, media buyouts, where we're gonna have the information presented on uh, various radio and television stations um, during various news cycles to inform the community and the regions about the Did we lose the sound? If yeah. if so, what I would say is the these slides are all uh, should all be part of the public record, and um, and we would encourage members of the public to reach out directly to Caltrans. Certainly, if any of our offices uh, receive inquiries, uh, this is this is very helpful for us to be able to redirect and share the information that they've provided. It, it appears he's speaking, but the audio isn't coming through. So. Excuse me. Uh, it appears he's still speaking, but the audio uh, the audio is not. Uh, the coming audio is not working. Um, my apologies that we that we're losing the end of the presentation. The that go out <laughs> via email, as well as we're doing project mailers and flyers, which are paper physical uh, uh, materials that the businesses can put in their windows or they can pass out. Um, it also is even mailed to over twenty thousand um, residents along the corridor of this particular project. Uh, next slide. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a specific website for this project. It's sr87pave.com, where people can get all the information regarding the, the project that's happening, as well as the, if they will have any concerns or questions, they can email us at that same particular website in the email address, as you can see below. We also have a dedicated hotline for this project as well for people that want to call in and voice any questions, concerns, or even celebratory uh, you know, uh, statements saying thank you for, for paving this project at 510-286-0319. Um, again, my name is Victor Gauthier. I will be the public information officer for this project. 
So everyone will constantly see information going out. Um, we've already started sending information out a few weeks ago, but again, residents will start receiving those mailers this week and many people will be receiving those digital assets uh, beginning this week as well, up until our last closure. Next slide. And with that being said, we just want to thank everyone for allowing us to present and I'm going to pass it back over to uh, Scott McCray. Thank you very much. What I'd like to do is uh, see if there's any public comment on the item and then um, go to my colleagues for, for questions on the presentation. Thank you. Curtis, do we have any speakers on Zoom or um, in the chambers? Looks like we have one speaker on Zoom. All right, uh, let's hear our speaker on Zoom, please. All right, our speaker is Blair Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Boy, just dimly trying to understand life in our government practices, our community practices. If I'm understanding this project uh, well, did, did I hear you say that it is also offering auxiliary uh, bike path programs and such? and the like uh, for in this project. Uh, seems like an important project. Thank you if you are. And uh, another question is, uh, with this sort of project, is there surveillance technology, new surveillance technology involved in this project? And if so, can it be named and labeled? And just to offer what sort of good uh, public policies you'll be practicing with this technology, I think it should be a fairly regular practice to do with this sort of item. Uh, just a reminder of that. Uh, you know, we should always, in our major projects, we should always be labeling and naming the surveillance technology and data collection that's also involved and just all the good practices involved. It just creates awareness and good consciousness and uh, our better practices. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes Scott. public comment. Thank you. No, excuse me. Excuse me, wait, that was public comment. That, that wasn't a direct question to you. I'm going to go to uh, my colleagues right now. Thank you. Supervisor Sumidian. Thanks. Um, first, let me just confirm uh, with the county executive and his team, this is an informational item, as President Ellenberg indicated. There's no direct county role here. Is that? That's absolutely correct. This is not a county project. This is a state. A Caltrans project, and this is an informational item. Well, thank you. I, th I do think it's useful to have as an informational item, and I also think it's useful to make that distinction clear because inevitably there will be calls or emails, and we'll know uh, where to forward those. And not to be casual about that, but I just I think um, folks want to know what uh, who they can talk to uh, if they've got questions along the way. And thank you again for the project hotline number. Um, Madam President and colleagues, I did uh, ask my office to let the folks from uh, Caltrans know yesterday uh, that I would have some questions for them about the timeline on El Camino Real, which is a state highway as well, uh, which is in a considerable state of disrepair. And so I want to ask somebody uh, from Caltrans to tell us uh, what the schedule is for repair of El Camino Real. This is. Uh, not an action item, uh, and um, I think I'm within the Brown Act rules to simply ask for some additional information about another state highway. So what can the folks in uh, Caltrans tell us? Good morning. Uh, this is Nick Sale. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. And through the chair, if I may, could you spell out your name just because I'm have, you have, you're a little fuzzy on our end, and I just want to make sure I have the right name. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. My name is Nick, N-I-C-K, last name Saleh. I am uh, the principal engineer for the Santa Clara County. Even though uh, on the monitor shows under a different name because it was forwarded to me by the project manager, Francis Mensa. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Samidian. I, I do actually, we have, uh, I have a good news regarding a Camino Real project, we have a project. Uh, this project actually proposed to rehab and provide ADA upgrades and other safety component through um, three towns of El Camino. It's uh, City of Mountain View, uh, Los Altos, and uh, Palo Alto. And the project should be awarded hopefully within a month to the contractor. And we suppose hopefully start construction late fall. And this is going to last for, I would say, a year and a half, two years uh, duration. 
and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll could add, uh, address all the payment uh, uh, distress and other related issues while we are in construction. Uh, at the same time, we are actually uh, within the project limit, we are coordinating with, in matter of fact, with the County of Santa Clara and the City of Palo Alto, a couple of projects, uh, major projects, sewer line replacement in Palo Alto and other, I believe, uh, roadway work uh, at Pejima. And I, I hope this address. Thank you. Understand. If I could, through the chair, could I get the timeline for the project? I, 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 the, how long that's going to take again? You, you shared it with us, but again, the uh, sound quality was not ideal. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I will close it to this. Yeah, it should, it should, it should last for two years, uh, given the fact that, you know, uh, uh, pending on, on weather condition and other unforeseen thing, uh, issues in the project. But I will estimate it to take a year and a half to two years to complete construction and hopefully we'll start construction late uh, fall of this year. Okay, and um, if I could get the spelling on your last name again, uh, I'm not sure I got it earlier. I got the N-I-C-K, but I didn't get the last name. Okay, it's Saleh, S-A-L-E-H. L-E-H, -H. thank you. I apologize, but the sound quality is not working for it. Um, sir, let me just, uh, through the chair, indicate that the reason for the question uh, is that um, Santa Clara County residents have been promised by Caltrans that these repairs would be made years ago. Uh, I asked my office and they were able to pull out press reports indicating that as far back as 2015, we were told that uh, the repaving would commence in 2021. That was reconfirmed in 2020, according to press reports. Again, that 2021 date. All the way back in uh, 2020, we had 231 lane miles uh, in distressed condition. And of course, that number or percentage has only increased in the subsequent years, given the weather. Uh, looking back into 2021, again, press reports then indicated, OK, not happening in 21. Now it'll happen in 22. Then uh, got pushed back again in 22, and now uh, earlier this year, press reports in the Mercury News indicated that we were told later in 2023. So there is this unfortunate history of coming soon, coming soon, coming soon, and not arriving, not arriving, not arriving. And Madam Chair, and I, I, I'm sharing this with the folks at Caltrans because I think that uh, folks there may not be entirely sensitive. And, and sir, you should know that during my time in the California State Senate, I chaired budget subcommittee number two, which was responsible for Caltrans funding. So I, I have some familiarity with your budget. And um, you know, we have the highest gas tax in the state, excuse me, in the country, in our, here in our state. We have the highest gas tax in the country. And I think most people are accustomed to paying it, uh, but they have a reasonable expectation that if they pay the highest gas tax in the nation, that they can get a pothole fixed. And in addition to that highest gas tax in the country, uh, local voters, as my colleagues know, have been very generous, uh, proving uh, additional taxes in 2000, 2008, 2016, uh, measures A and B, uh, the Caltrain tax, uh, measure RR, uh, RM3, the increased tolls. Uh, more recently, we have uh, Senator Weiner's proposal for yet another increase in tolls. And again, people have been very, very supportive and very generous, but they are understandably wondering, what does it take to simply get an everyday state highway that is used by folks up and down the peninsula and in the South Bay, paved to an acceptable level. And so I, I took this opportunity because it seems to be the only opportunity uh, available to get the folks at Caltrans on record. Uh, and you know, my hope is that 23 doesn't slip into 24 uh, or 25, which has been the unfortunate history. And uh, sir, are you still there and can you hear me loud and clear? Because I want to close with just one brief story. Yes, I'm still here. Thank you. Um, I, 
about six months ago, and I'm looking at one of my colleagues here uh, who uh, is, had to listen to some of my stories. About six months ago, uh, I got just a garden variety virus, and so I was fortunate enough to be able to make my way to urgent care and uh, ask uh, the physician there on duty to make sure that's all it was. And uh, she said, yep, that's probably what it is, and you'll just tough it out. And why am I telling you about my visit to urgent care, you might reasonably ask. And the answer is that after my 15 minutes, the physician apparently recognized that I was a member of the County Board of Supervisors and asked me the same question that I get routinely when I meet with community members at sidewalk office hours. She said, I hope you don't mind my imposing on your visit to the doctor, but when are we going to get some help with El Camino Real? Now, the reason she asked is because people who show up at Sutter at Palo Alto Medical Foundation are people who are typically either ill or with someone who's ill or who is in some form of discomfort. And she said, it's absolutely horrific. And uh, I said, you don't need to tell me that. I just rode over it to get here and was reminded of it yet again. Uh, but, you know, that's the level of sort of immediacy that people feel, um, it, it's not just a minor inconvenience. I know the folks at Caltrans know that when we have rough roads, that there's a direct cost in terms of increased maintenance and repair that typically exceeds $1,000 a vehicle per year. And um, I just want to say um, one last time, Madam Chair, and thank you for your patience and thank you to the folks at Caltrans. It, you got to get going this year, guys. You just have to. Uh, and if not, you can't be surprised that a willingness to support so-called improvements with additional funding will not be forthcoming. People are at the end of their rope on this one. It's a basic governmental responsibility. And I would argue that when you can't handle the basic governmental responsibilities, you can't be surprised that people lose trust in their government on issues great and small and that has serious consequences for not only our county, but our state and our nation. Thank you. Supervisor, may I, may I respond? Uh, briefly, yes, and then we're going to move on in Very our briefly, agenda. Thank you so much, Supervisor Semelia, and thank you for your support uh, to Caltrans and to, uh, for your public uh, uh, service. You know, I, I think you just, I want to clear for the record that the dates this was provided early on was maybe misquoted between different type of work, and I, I was, involved in that correction of those dates. Um, and I'm glad that it's a minor virus. I, uh, I, you know, last, so when our year was a stormy year and we had 73 directors order emergency contract to repair all the work, more than $150 million worth of work. Uh, uh, I will uh, make sure that the project goes smooth and um, on time and then hopefully uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get all this concept taken care of. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move to item uh, nine, which is a resolution in support of gender affirming care, um, which I am bringing forward at the request of work group members uh, who developed this resolution. So let me begin with a thank you uh, to Dr. Leilani Jones, Catherine Lico, and Madeline Swart in the Health System Office of Equity, uh, Jenny Lamb from County, County Council's Office, and Alicia Musquiz in the Behavioral Health Services Department, and of course, Sarah Fernando in the Office of LGBTQ Plus Affairs. Uh, I'm not going to read the entirety uh, of the resolution. I, I'm certain my colleagues have read it, and, and it is part of the agenda. But I do want to publicly confirm um, for our organization and for members of the public that the County of Santa Clara will not sit on our collective hands while fear-mongering and legislative bullying across gender, around gender-affirming care slithers across the country. Those laws and policies inflict direct harm on our children, their families, and their future. Gender-affirming care is health care, and Santa Clara County is committed to improving the quality and accessibility of care for all residents, including all transgender and gender expansive children. 
The development of our gender health clinic was the result of the hard work of many people from both our primary care system and the LGBTQ plus community. There have been some significant challenges along the way, including health system wide challenges created by the pandemic and a lengthy search for a permanent experienced medical director. Santa Clara County is committed to becoming a regional and national leader in the provision of gender responsive care to our community. To achieve that goal, we need and want the community's feedback, which is critical to continuously improving care in our programs. I'd like to add to my motion um, that I'm going to make in the, in the moment, um, in a moment, um, to, uh, to adopt the resolution, direction to administration to report at a future board meeting in 60 days, or the meeting closest to 60 days, on the current challenges and opportunities relative to gender affirming care for county patients with details regarding how the county works internally and externally to improve care and incorporate a wide range of perspectives and needs in implementing our services. And I will um, sunshine that my team uh, reviewed this, uh, this requested direction uh, with the hospital system CEO, Paul Lorenz. So with that, I would move approval of the resolution and the report back and respectfully request a second. I'm honored to second. Thank you very much. Do we have public speakers on this item? We have uh, no public speakers on this item. Turning back to my colleagues, any comments? Uh, Supervisor Arenas and then Supervisor Lee. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, President Ellenberg, for bringing this forward. Um, it's really important for us to be in a position um, that leads the way um, for other states, um, but especially for our next generation. Um, and I absolutely believe in gender affirming medical and behavioral um, health care. I want to just talk a little bit about what we're facing and the importance of this resolution because we may not face this here in California, but there's children across the U.S. Um, such as in Mississippi, where there is a law banning the conduct of the AIDS or abets in minors receiving care applies to everyone, including parents. In other states, it only applies to healthcare providers. In North Dakota, providing medication is considered a misdemeanor, and surgical care is a felony. Um, in Tennessee's law, it doesn't specifically ban the conduct of a, uh, aid or abet, but it does ban anyone from providing hormone-related medication to minors. I don't know why we are at this point that we are at across our country with such varying degrees of care for our children. Um, and so I'm, I'm really grateful that you've put this forward. Uh, it means a lot to, to me, and it means, I think, a lot to a lot of those children and families who are battling it out in their own respective states. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you so much. I would note, just very briefly, before turning to Supervisor Lee, that it's in California, uh, too. The, the California Attorney General on Monday morning uh, announced that his office is suing the Chino Valley Unified School District to stop enforcement of a recently passed policy requiring parents uh, to be notified if their uh, child chooses to identify as, um, if their child identifies as transgender in the school. So even in what we think of often as shiny blue California, um, there, are, there are significant challenges here. So thank you for your beautiful words and your support. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Ellenberg. And I'm not sure my words will be as beautiful, but I'm sure it's as um, direct. Let me get closer. Thank you. I took off my mask just to make sure I get the word clear. Gender affirming care is not merely a medical procedure. It really is a lifeline validating individuals' authentic identity and ensuring their mental and physical well-being. But more importantly, gender affirming care saves lives. For the past year, the vitriol against transgender populations has increased significantly 
in the entire country, and many states led by non-medically trained politicians are rushing to pass laws to ban gender-affirming care. Their concerns to ban these cares is not at all based on any medical science. We are talking about medical science, like doctors of the American Medical Association representing over 300,000 doc 300, doctors, the American Psychiatric Association with over 38,000 psychiatrists, and virtually all the medical associations. In the name of protecting children, uninformed lawmakers are using culture issues to divide our communities and frankly, using hate and fear to do fundraising and earn likes on social media to raise their profiles or earn votes. These rhetoric and poorly drafted state laws have made it open season to allow bullying and discriminating against transgender people, making cruel and disgusting behavior against our children acceptable. This is not only unacceptable, it is dangerous and will result in violence. Violence by others and even by victims themselves. Families with children receiving gender-affirming care in states, passing those bans are now considering leaving their homes for generations and their states. Those being bullied suffer depression, fear, many unfortunately turn to substance abuse to dull these pains and even attempt to suicides. We must eliminate outside interference of our own confidential doctor-patient relationship with our own medical care. This is an assault of our basic freedom to receive medical care for ourselves and our families. For these reasons, I'm just so grateful, thank you, President Ellenberg, for bringing this important resolution to reaffirm our county's commitment to protect everyone with proven medical science. Because when it comes to medical care, let's trust our doctors and keep those politicians out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's vote on the resolution, please. Supervisor Arenas. Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. And the motion passes. Colleagues, thank you very much. Item 10 is... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't think to pause for applause, but yes, thank you. And thank you all uh, for your tremendous work on this, on this resolution. Thank you. All right. County, count, County Executive James Williams. Before I start my report, I just want to add administration strong support for the resolution and the outstanding work of our staff who have been leading on these issues for a number of years. Uh, I had a few items I wanted to uh, share with the board. First, following up on my report from the last meeting, the assessor's office uh, successfully opened for business yesterday at 130 West Tasman. I understand there were many customers receiving services at the new location, so folks were able to get there, which was good news, and there's been, I think, a good signage here about that as well. Next office to move will be DTAC on September 11th. We are uh, monitoring wildfires in Northern California closely and wanted to share that there's about 38 personnel from across the operational area that have been deployed in support of those fires uh, in Northern California. Um, last week, I held my first employee uh, town hall meeting with Chief Operating Officer Greta Hansen uh, via Zoom. The meeting at the bridge was an opportunity to introduce myself to county employees and answer live questions. Over 1,600 county employees uh, participated in that 45-minute program, and about 50 questions were submitted. Uh, so I think it was quite a successful uh, event to build on that high level of employee engagement. I look forward to holding uh, another meeting at the bridge before the end of December and seeking out opportunities to visit employees across our county uh, facilities. Uh, we're continuing to increase our advocacy and engagement in Sacramento and President Ellenberg is uh, hosting uh, tomorrow an informal caucus with our local delegation uh, that I will be uh, joining to help bring our representatives up to speed on issues that matter to Santa Clara County and look forward to that uh, engagement uh, tomorrow in Sacramento. Also wanted to note uh, something of, of concern for our agricultural community. This uh, last week, the California Department of Food and Agriculture confirmed a detection of the oriental fruit fly in Santa Clara County. It's an invasive species that presents a significant threat to agriculture. The state uh, is the lead on this, but just wanted to share for informational purposes, they launched uh, emergency action starting on Saturday to treat and address the issue. 
Uh, and finally, wanted to share that we had a successful uh, Diversity Day event hosted by the Social Services Agency last Friday. I want to thank Supervisor Lee. Uh, the Chief Operating Officer was there as well. I want to thank the uh, SSA administration and the many, many staff uh, in the Social Services Agency who put on that successful event. It was the first time back uh, since the pandemic, uh, and it was, a, it was a really lovely event. Um, with that, happy to answer questions from the board. Thank you very much, Supervisor Simidian. Actually, I have a request uh, for both um, the county executive and county council because uh, the issue is a cross-cutting one, and that is uh, uh, in anticipation of the coming election season, could we get an off-agenda memo, confidential only to the extent that it needs to be, um, on the issue of uh, our registrar voters' systems, our voting systems, uh, and their um, compliance with state and federal regulations. And uh, also uh, as to precautions, and this is why I referenced the fact that some of this may need to be uh, confidential, precautions taken uh, to ensure the security of those systems. Uh, colleagues, uh, I think um, perhaps only Supervisor Chavez and I were here uh, in the 2014, 15, 16 range when we uh, were dealing both with, frankly, a, a, an office that was struggling to keep up with the demands of the times and uh, also with um, uh, obviously threats of uh, interference from bad actors, both state and non-state actors, and uh, I was uh, chairing FGOC at the time, we handled some of that there. So uh, if there's an interest at FGOC, fair enough, but I think meantime, if we could ask for a, um, an off-agenda memo, both on the sort of operation side, which is why I'm looking to the county executive, but also on the legal sufficiency side, and uh, also addressing security matters, uh, I think that's something that we would uh, be better uh, served by doing now rather than in a moment of urgency. Thank you. We'd be happy to do so. Thank you. Not seeing any other uh, lights on. Item uh, 11 is to receive a report from County Council. There were no reportable actions taken at the August 28th, 2023 closed session meeting. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, what I'd like to do right now, um, I, I anticipate that item 14 may take some time um, and the others will likely be addressed very briefly. So I, I'd like to propose that we hear 13 and 16 and then determine um, how close we may or may not be to a lunch break and decide if we're going to hear uh, 14 before lunch or after. Any objections to that proposal? Seeing no vehemently shaking heads, um, let's um, address item 13, which is the adult caregiving study. And you're welcome to those of you who will now move on with your day more promptly. <laughs> You need your mic first, Marianne. Good morning. I'm Marianne Warren, the director of the Department of the Aging and Adult Services for the Social Services Agency. With me, I have Diana Miller, our project manager for the Seniors Agenda within the Department of Aging and Adult Services, and Dr. Monique Parrish, is Parrish of Life Course Strategies, who is the consultant on this study. The age-friendly three-year action plan was developed by the community. There was a consensus that a study of family caregivers and the caregiver workforce would be the first step in addressing the needs and advancing a person and family-centered caregiving support system. In March 2022, the Board of Supervisors approved a referral for the administration to report back to the board in May with a proposal to conduct a comprehensive study of older adult caregiving needs and the capacity in Santa Clara County. The county then entered into an agreement with Dr. Parrish to conduct the study and produce a report and recommendations. 
Today, we will be reviewing the caregiver study method, key findings, recommendations, and next steps. And next slide. And Diana, you need a mic also. Okay. Did it go on? Okay, thank you. The county's population of older adults is growing rapidly, according to recent state projections. It is a trend that is forecast to continue decades to come with major social, economic, environmental, political, and land use planning impacts. Older is rapidly becoming the new normal, a reality that requires preparation and adaption. This trend will continue as the last baby boomer dies, the millennials will be turning 65, and there are more of them than of us baby boomers. People are living longer with serious health conditions and disabilities requiring care. The number of individuals with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias is also expected to increase in Santa Clara County from about 46,000 in 2025 to 82,000 in 2040. These populations underscore the number of family caregivers and direct care workers that will be needed to meet this need. Next slide. Caregiving has attracted significant attention in recent years. In 2022, the National Strategy to Support Family Caregivers, and in April 2023, Presidential Executive Order in, on Increasing Access to High Quality Care and Supporting Caregivers, outlined a robust federal strategy to provide more comprehensive and coordinated care and support of family caregivers. California is also addressing the caregiver issue. The California Department of Aging is leading implementation of the 2021 California Master Plan for Aging, a 10-year blueprint for building a California for all ages. Goal four of the Master Plan on Aging, five bold goals, is caregiver, caregiving that works. Next slide. The study used a mixed methods approach of collecting and analyzing primary quantitative and qualitative data to meet the study objectives and analyze secondary caregiver data that can be found in the chart book. The Santa Clara County caregiving study methods included a caregiving expert work group of 12 organizations that met regularly to review and offer feedback. Caregiver organizations, both nonprofits and agencies providing paid caregivers, were surveyed. Caregiver experts were interviewed, legislation and policies reviewed, research into the best practices of other counties and states, family caregiver focus groups, and direct care worker focus groups informed the key findings. Next slide. And then the findings are, who is providing care in Santa Clara County? And what are their needs? And we heard overwhelmingly over and over again from the surveys, from the interviews, from the focus groups, these same things. Um, that there are 177,000 family caregivers. Over half have provided care for more than two years. 79% are performing complex medical and nursing tasks. What family caregivers want are accessible information and referral system, affordable and accessible respite care, more support groups and counseling, 36% of those surveyed did say that they were depressed, and transportation, education, and training. Direct care workers, there are 40,000 in our county, are mostly women aged 45 to 63 who speak English, while Vietnamese, Spanish, and Mandarin are the primary language for many in-home supportive service providers. In-home supportive service providers make up 30,000 of the direct care workforce in our county. The direct care workers want a living wage, stable work hours, training and career advancement, job oversight and support, and also affordable housing, childcare, and transportation stipends. Resp pardon me, responding to the needs of family caregivers and direct care workers is essential to building a strong and sustainable caregiving support system in our county. Next slide. 
the recommendations are organized under these five areas. I will highlight only one of the recommendations for each category. The rest are found in our report. Under implement system change, we request that the healthcare systems and providers recognize, engage, and support family caregivers in the caregiving roles and participate in the county caregiver initiatives. To promote caregiver awareness, education, and training, we uh, recommend launching a countywide caregiver education campaign to help residents to recognize themselves as caregivers and seek information and support. Many people do not even consider them carege themselves caregivers, although they, that's the work that they're doing. Increase availability and affordability of caregiver services and supports. And one is to develop a recommendation to develop a long-term plan to increase the number and affordability of respite care services in and out of the home. This is one of the major um, things we heard from uh, family caregivers. Invest in the direct care workforce. So we'd ask to research the viability of creating and implementing an in-home support services direct care worker career ladder. And promote paid family leave benefits. So we'd like to develop a campaign to increase knowledge about paid family leave benefits for all employees and employers in the county. Next slide. Uh, action steps that can begin now include utilizing information referral systems like 211 and county communications to educate the public on caregiver resources, such as the upcoming Caregiver Counts. Um, it's a virtual uh, five Saturday or four Saturdays in September uh, information and education for family caregivers. Establish an Aging and Disability Resource Center. I'm happy to report that SourceWise, our area agency on aging, and Silicon Valley Independent Living Center will submit a letter of intent to the California Department of Aging in the fall to create our own local ADRC. Engage health and hospital systems to support family caregivers and participate in caregiver initiatives. Family caregivers report the disconnect from hospital to home. Develop campaign on paid family leave benefits. Most employees are not familiar with this benefit and how to use it. Increase public awareness of state caregiver surveys and encourage participation in the California Health Interview Survey and the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, such as the type of outreach that we did during the uh, US Census to get people aware and answer their phone or the postcard. Collaborate with other counties in the state to create an in-home support services direct care uh, worker career ladder and promote CalGROWS and other educational opportunities already available. Caregiving defines, defines us as a people. Since I'm a retiree in a month, I will conclude with an exhortation to us all. It is on us to reframe care as a societal to reframe care as a societal responsibility not a personal one. It is on us to ensure that paid and unpaid caregivers alike have their tools and resources they need to thrive. And it is on us to remember that all of us are just one diagnosis away from needing or providing care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick semantic note from my ever invisible generation, Jen, uh, X is turning 65 in the, in the next few years, not the millennials. You're also always forgotten. We so are anyway. classically <laughs> always forgotten, so I must represent <laughs> my generation. Uh, let me go first to public comment and then come back for any uh, questions uh, from the board members. Thank you all very much for the report. Curtis, do we have any speakers? We have uh, two speakers in chambers and two speakers on Zoom. All right, same message regarding closing of the speaker queues when the first person begins speaking. All right, our in-chambers speakers are Catherine Kelly, uh, followed by Paul Soto. Hello, honorable supervisors. My name is Catherine Kelly, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs for OnLock. 
On behalf of Onlock and the over 1,800 frail seniors who we serve through Onlock PACE, it's my honor to lend our full support to the recommendations put forth in the Santa Clara County Adult Caregiving Study. PACE, the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly, which Unlock created, is a model of care designed to enable frail seniors to remain at home by providing comprehensive medical and long-term care services fully coordinated by an interdisciplinary team. As a nonprofit who has been serving seniors for over 52 years and a PACE provider in Santa Clara County for 14 years, we were honored to be a partner in developing this report and are pleased that PACE is called out as a caregiver best practice program. Across the three counties we serve, Santa Clara, Alameda, and San Francisco, Onlock employs nearly 300 direct care workers, both in our day health center and community caregivers who provide care in the home. Unlock's direct care workers are an essential part of our seniors care team, ensuring that they not only receive personal care services, but by providing a connection between the senior and the rest of the care team. We also want to call out the recommendations to establish an aging and disability connection to provide a one-stop shop for caregivers, as well as continuing education and training for professional caregivers and unpaid family caregivers at home. The report states that family caregivers are often described as the backbone of every community's long-term care system and that direct care workers are an essential part of the caregiver service system. Unlock wholeheartedly agrees and we are honored to lend our full support. Thank you. Curtis, we have our next speaker. Oh, apologies, thank you. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Thank you for making the connection between land use issues and seniors. I'm reading a letter that uh, uh, at that time Councilwoman Arenas wrote on my behalf. Our council committee, committee meetings are long and weekly, and despite that, Paul identifies and keeps track of issues that have perpetually suppressed our Latino community, such as land use. Past land use policies were racist, yet were used to systematically discriminate against people of color. There are issues that impact race that are more nuanced and subtle than, say, police use of force. Paul's ability to identify these issues and integrate his perspective have allowed for our council to hear the results of systemic racism. Paul brings his experience growing up in a gang-impacted area of San Jose, like many of us, to point out how brown people are segregated and suppressed and tie it back to policy. He literally brings San Jose history to life. I am immensely grateful for his perspective and his knowledge of San Jose history. His advocacy has created opportunities for me as a council member to point out the ramifications of policies on the Latino community. That's only a portion of the letter, and I want to thank you for writing that on my behalf, uh, Supervisor Arenas. And what is happening is that you, the caregiver is going to be systematically gentrified out. And that's why land use issues are critically important because the ability for the caregiver to stabilize here in the community is going to continually be challenged as the gentrification process continues. They bring those fears and anxieties to the senior in the last stages of their life, which means that they, the emotional capacity for the caregiver to give care to the senior is compromised because of those fears and we can tie it back to the gentrification process. So that needs to be considered within the overall context of these meetings, and I'd like to hear a little bit of, about that from you in terms of what you're gonna do about it. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on to our Zoom speakers. We have three speakers currently in queue. Thank you very much. The queue will close when the first speaker begins speaking. All right, our first Zoom speaker is Blair Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the words of Paul Soto. As almost always, he has something really interesting to say. Thank you. Um, for myself, you know, this is a, a, an issue of life and society and our life within society. Uh, I'm 50 plus years old now. Um, I think through a, a number of experiments and just experiences, uh, I, I realized my own brain was starting to lose it <laughs> at about 40. And um, so I'm interested in Alzheimer's issues. You reported that there's going to be double the amount of Alzheimer's by 2040. 
uh, I've gotten a jump on that. I think you can hear in my public comment, I'm not altogether there a lot of times at public comment. I wish I was, but uh, so it goes. I'm trying my best to maintain. And, uh, you know, it, it hurts. It, it takes a lot of effort. And I, I guess my, my advice in such a space is that uh, clarity is really important and that we have a tendency to play games in how we work and talk in our community practices. And so that's part of my energy and drive in wanting things to just be clear and understandable and we don't pussyfoot and we don't fuss around and we don't play games with this stuff. I mean, this is really serious, important stuff. If we're direct and honest with each other, I think we can get so many good, better results with things. That, uh, so it's important to me. A reminder that I think it can actually address Alzheimer's for our future and, and lessen it in the future, actually. And it's from that, uh, about the issue of caregiver services. Uh, they're an important part of, of, of services in, in, in our Santa Clara County. Uh, the work of State of New York uh, in like the 2000s did some incredible work. So as they're not a unionized process, they can have good rules that they can lean on and understand uh, good worker rights issues. Good luck in looking at those things. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christina Irving. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. Thank you, President Elberg and, and supervisors. I'm Christina Irving. I'm from Family Caregiver Alliance, a nonprofit that has been working with family caregivers for over 40 years in the county. Um, I want to thank the county and the supervisors for recognizing the needs of family caregivers and making this study possible. Um, families provide the majority of long-term care. Um, and often with impacts on their own health. Um, as was heard, high rates of depression and high rates of physical health issues impact family caregivers throughout the course of their caregiving experience. Um, our long-term care and our medical systems are not sufficient to meet the, old, the needs of older adults without the work that family caregivers provide, but the supports available to them are currently minimal um, and navigating through the healthcare system just adds unnecessary stress. The county has made great progress in their age-friendly initiatives, but the recommendations from this study are needed to truly allow people to age in place. Supporting family caregivers is important for their own physical and mental health, um, but it also helps older adults remain out of long-term care facilities and within their home and their community for longer. I hope the board will support the recommendations in the caregiver study and help move the county forward in truly becoming an age-friendly community. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Vaughn Villaverde. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. Thank you, President Ellenberg and members of the board. My name is Vaughn Villaverde, Director of Advocacy at ACI. And I've been part of the um, group of community members and organizations that has been advocating for this study since I think about 2018. Um, so I'm really, really grateful and, and it feels really gratifying um, to see the finished product. I wanted to thank um, folks at DOS and Dr. Parrish for your tremendous hard work. And I also wanted to thank members of the Board of Supervisors uh, for making this uh, study possible. And um, I would encourage you to, as you review um, the recommendations and enact them um, that you always keep in mind um, language access and cultural sensitivity as we implement new programs reform our current systems um, just because as as the state and as the county's population is is growing more diverse so is our older adult population so i would highly encourage us to always keep that cultural com uh, component in mind as we move forward thanks again that concludes public comment Thank you very much. Looking to my uh, colleagues for comments first. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you to the team and all the folks behind the team that you represent. Um, I, I asked that we undertake this effort because I have a longstanding concern that too often we find ourselves responding to a demonstrated need rather than anticipating a need that we could and should be seeing coming right at us. And your presentation on just the simple demographics was sort of what motivated me um, and, and now reinforces 
uh, my concern that we get out in front of the need rather, again, than sort of scramble with buckets uh, when the time comes. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I was curious, I don't think we heard anyone uh, this morning, this afternoon almost, from SourceWise, our um, designated uh, agency uh, uh, on aging and our area agency on, a on aging, to use the proper term. Um, where are they in this conversation? Um, they were, SourceWise was one of the uh, 12 work group members and did participate, and they also shared their um, data with us, and they are now in the process of also collecting more surveys for their next um, uh, uh, aging and adult services survey in Santa Clara County. Uh, and they also were part of the, uh, like, uh, expert interviews mm -hmm. that we did. Well, there, as I understand it, and as I thought I heard you say earlier today, and please clarify or correct if need be, they're going to be uh, the area agency on aging is an essential player in terms of creating an aging and disability resource center, yes? Yes. So according to state, the only people that can apply for that um, is the, your area agency on aging and your uh, silicon and your independent living center, and they have to do it as a combo. So now I'm, you know, happy to report that they have been in conversation and are going to be submitting a letter of intent for funding for a, a we call it ADRC for our county. So I, I can add to that, um, Supervisor Sumiti, and if you'd like a little bit more uh, information, uh, Susan De, De Marios, who's the director of the California Department of Aging, um, submitted a, a letter with a requested. Uh, amendment to the, um, the, the um, I think it's the, the founding documents for the, for the Aging and Disability uh, Resource Center, which would involve um, uh, periodic evaluations and reviews of the area agencies um, uh, rather than the current perpetual status that we that we currently have. There's some suggestions that it perhaps be reviewed in connection with the census, but just uh, want you to know that there is some awareness at the state level of the, uh, uh, of the challenges that, that we have experienced in some areas and are working to improve that. Well, Madam President, if I may say this, and I mean it as a compliment, you're far more tactful than I am uh, inclined to be about what I think it is fair to characterize as a, um, an uneven performance over the course of the past 10 years that Supervisor Chavez and I have been on this board. And of course, she's taken a leadership role at our Children's, Seniors, and Families Committee. Uh, and um, that is, in fact, what prompted my question. Uh, and I guess I would like to ask through the chair, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll make the motion for purposes of discussion and then see if we can flesh it out a little bit that we receive the report, um, which is the only recommended action today. So I'll move approval of the recommended action, but also with uh, direction to staff through the chair, and I guess that means county executive and his team, um, that we get some additional information on the uh, area agency on aging and source wise in this case and their role and responsibility uh, and funding obligations, if any, uh, when this item comes back to us. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't want to um, put more, well, I guess I do want to put more work on the Children's, Seniors, and Families Committee. I feel a little bad about doing that when uh, Supervisor Chavez is not here to say, sure, that's fine, but I think um, she's probably uh, game and the committee is game. So I'll, I'll ask that we refer the item to the committee uh, as well, because if we're really going to make the progress on this immense challenge that you have anticipated uh, and that we now have data to support, uh, and we have a list of action items. Uh, that's not going to happen, in my judgment, if we have um, 
anything other than an exemplary uh, AAA and, uh, and an exemplary working relationship with that organization. Uh, to be fair, there have been changes in leadership over the years. There have been you know, changes in service. My office and I have worked collaboratively with SourceWise uh, on a project or two along the way, but uh, to call it uneven would be to understate the case uh, over the last decade. And I, uh, I think this is too big and too important to just hope that that all works out. So. That uh, was a long-winded explanation for what is thus far a relatively short uh, uh, motion, and I will add a little to it in a minute with consent from my colleagues. I'll second. Thank you. And then, um, and this is not meant as a critique, it's just meant as a sort of an observation about the irony of, you know, when we look at the data, and I think you have communicated the sort of sense of urgency that I hoped you would, on the other hand, now we're talking about five-year plans, and I'm thinking, I'm not sure we got five years. Um, I, you know, just in terms of who's here, who's going to be here, what their needs are going to be. Um, I mean, I, I'm going to just ask you point blank, and then I'll actually stop for a second and listen. I, I hear you saying loud and clear, we have not enough caregivers for the volume of older adults that currently exist, let alone those who will be older adults in the immediate future. Did I hear that right? Uh, yes, did you wanna elaborate on that? Sure. Um, so Monique Parrish and the primary consultant for this project. And before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the team from DOS and also all of the members of the work group who I thought were just phenomenal. And just if I may add, I am also a licensed clinical social worker and I provide uh, caregiver support groups. I work a day a week in a federally qualified health center providing behavioral health. So this study was especially important to me. I want to stress, and you all know this, that you have an incredible county. It's multiracial, multiethnic, multilingual, multicultural. You have representation across the county with some really pretty tre tremendous resources, mm -hmm. but the scaffolding needs to be fleshed out. And so that is this call to action that we are highlighting that uh, bringing people together, including marginalized and disenfranchised communities so that they're part of this examination. So the urgency, um, Supervisor Simidian, is exactly on point. And what we are hoping is that there is this richness in the community, that you use the resources and the people who are champions, and looking very creatively, but making sure that all groups are represented in the solutions. And it does require looking at both family caregivers and what we call the direct care workers. Uh, many of those, those individuals in each group are challenged by resources, whether it's housing and transportation, it's providing in and out of home respite care. So the solutions, as the highlighted priorities indicate, really have to be cross-sectional. They have to be looking at working with this existing infrastructures, but also adding resources. I really just would like to close that it was an opportunity that I think along with so many other urgent issues, still has to be square, front and square on the, the, uh, your focus as you move forward because the data is really there in terms of both the aging projections but also the aging disability and related dementias projections. I'd like to stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Through the chair, I think um, I want to highlight a concern and have just a brief conversation about how we address that concern. Uh, packet page 80, page 3 of 4 in the report, uh, after uh, the half dozen bulleted points about uh, directions that we might take, references the fact, and I'm going to read uh, verbatim just a sentence fragment, several other recommendations will require resources that do not yet exist. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's kind of the show me the money line of the report, uh, which is we get this. And, you know, I want to sort of ask that in the next report back, we talk about w what those other recommendations are and what resources are ne necessary to address not only the half dozen that you've bullet pointed for us, but these other recommendations. And I'm asking because. Uh, unfortunately, 
you know, this isn't a relatively small item that a board member comes up with and says, gee, wouldn't it be great if we could do X, which we sometimes do, and then we engage in a uh, collaborative conversation with our county executive about the state of our budget, and, uh, you know, we got the, the word pretty loud and clear from our previous CEO and the current CEO as we entered into our budget this year that, you know, a decade of relative prosperity had kind of unfortunately come to an end, that in fact, the year ahead and arguably longer looks that much tougher. So we're receiving this report at exactly the moment in time when some would argue we are less able to afford uh, a, a sort of a robust response than we would have been at any time in the last decade. Um, so that's an obvious source of concern, and so I want to ask the county executive and your team when you come back to sort of talk about that, funding strategies, uh, sources, uh, what, are, what are the hard costs, really out-of-pocket costs that uh, this costs. I, um, uh, I've been at this long enough now, and uh, doctor, I'm sure you're uh, aware of it from your work that, um, you know, IHSS is, uh, <laughs> has a cost associated with it which was not really anti fully anticipated or appreciated when the program began a couple decades ago now. Um, so I, I think we need to do that. And then the last thing, and then I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll yield my time to uh, Supervisor Lee, who will get that joke. Um, uh, <laughs> So if I said, look forward to the report in, in April, but um, what, what do we know right here, right now, we need to get started on in the next year and a half? I, I picked that because that's how long Supervisor Chavez and I have uh, to stay, a little less, to stay on the board. Um, Ms. Miller, I can see you looking at, I, you know that I've had a passion for uh, adult day services, adult day health. Um, you know, I think there are tremendous alternatives, but I also know there's, they're costly alternatives. So next year and a half, what should we be saying, you know, can't wait, got to get on the hurry up drill on this one? So um, I would say um, that, you know, people, the family caregivers, the two things that they really want are information and they want, you know, kind of referral and where to go. Some of those things are easy to do in some ways, like how it's pretty fragmented and a lot of people become caregivers overnight. Um, and then, uh, so I think that's one thing is really to look at how we can get the word out in different ways um, and get more information and referral, which hopefully the ADRC will help us with. Uh, and then the other one would be uh, the whole respite you know, either in home. And right now with the elder economic index that takes into account uh, your local economy, 32% uh, of our older adults cannot meet their basic needs. So that's about 128,000 people, which is uh, equivalent to the population of the state capital of Kansas, Topeka. So we have a big lift no matter what it is. But I was encouraged because the federal government's looking at this and also the state. And I think our report, if shown to the state, is gives them some uh, more leverage and momentum as we move forward on you know, other uh, sources of uh, where to look for funding or resources for older adults from other levels of government too. So let me put your colleagues on the spot. And I see uh, Dr. Paris already got her hand up, so that's easy. Uh, and um, by saying, do you agree that those are two uh, priorities for the next year and a half? Dr. Parrish? I, I think that's essential. I think what, what caregivers were saying over and over again, and by the way, when I reference caregivers, it's broad, including direct care workers, was a centralized and coordinated information system. When you go into the hospital with a loved one and your, your loved one has suffered some incident that's requiring long-term care, you're maybe fortunately given a list of resources and you start out absolutely overwhelmed and completely confused about what to do. So having that information, whether it's an aging disability resource center 
or using some existing information. By the way, the report walks through lots of potential ideas here. That is an absolute first and foremost because that's where the need is currently. You referenced as well um, supervisors submitting the adult day feasibility study or the former adult day, this issue, which is where people need, caregivers need respite. So again, leaning into that, looking at some of the data about the effectiveness of that particular pilot and looking at ways with coordinating with partners in the community, whether that, again, I wanna be very careful, I don't overstep my bounds about what is and isn't feasible, but looking at partners to support that. I also wanna add that California is undergoing a major transformation with CalAIM, the California Advancing and Innovating Medi-Cal. So we know that our Medi-Cal managed care health partners are also really important partners and collaborators collaborators for this space. They are working with caregivers of individuals who may be uh, individuals with complex conditions who are frequently admitted. And this also, I just want to make a quick comment, goes across every group. And I, that's why there is this opportunity, of course, Medi-Cal serving those who are underserved uh, fiscally, but that is a major player as well as commercial health care insurers. So we just didn't want to bypass the opportunity to include them in this conversation. I um, appreciate the fact that you are highlighting what is sometimes overlooked in terms of the value of adult day services and adult day health care, which is the benefit to the caregiver rather than the direct recipient of the service, because the caregiver, of course, then has the benefit of respite even as the uh, older adult is, is getting the direct service. So thank you for that. Um, I am pressing on these two points, not because, I want to be clear about this, not because I don't think that the rest of the work is important, of course it is, um, but because I, I worry that when we get a really thorough response, which is, so take that as the compliment I mean it to be, that it's too easy to get lost in the you know bigness of it all, and so I'm like, okay, right here, right now, cut to the chase, what can we do? And so now I'm gonna to look to Ms. Warren who, and say, if we said as part of the motion um, that we're going to look at those two pieces, uh, information and referral and respite, does that sound like a sensible first couple of things to tackle? Absolutely. Uh, even with your mic off, I could hear you say absolutely, <laughs> so I'll just put it on, on the record. So I'm going to ask that the report back, which I believe is scheduled for April of 24, um, bring back those two items as uh, items that will already be sort of underway uh, at work, that, that those, they be prioritized in terms of the report back uh, and that the staff uh, be prioritizing them in terms of the work you do between now and then. Again, just to be clear, not because the rest of it isn't important, but because if you have 20 priorities, you don't really have 20 priorities. If you have two priorities, I think you could have two priorities, and we might see some real result. And then the last thing I'll say, uh, with the consent of the seconder in terms of incorporating that direction is, information and referral sounds like a kind of a soft service uh, to a lot of people. And you have referenced a couple of times, but I just want to underscore it. Um, not so if you're looking, I mean, you, you, Dr. Parrish, you referenced the, you know, uh, the folks who are not in that family caregiver category as also needing that service. But if you're a family caregiver and, and you get this role or responsibility suddenly thrust on you the way you've described it, you have no idea where the hell you're supposed to go to get the help you need, or let alone the advice or just some plain old fashioned information uh, about what do I do when this happens? What do I do when that happens? And um, colleagues and uh, Mr. Williams and team, I'm thinking a little bit of, I'm not suggesting that the model is uh, ideal, but I'm thinking a little bit of the conversations we had around the mental health navigators uh, because that's another case or place where people suddenly say, hey, I got this thing to deal with in my family and I am no way an expert on it. How do we navigate our way through that system? I think this is a little different than, I think it's also a little more than given the complexity of the systems, multiplicity of different places you have to become familiar with. Um, but I, I did want to underscore that I think it's um, very, very real, very tangible. It's not a mushy, fuzzy thing 
the way I think it is sometimes portrayed, in, and, and candidly in some cases is. Well, we'll just push out more information. No, in this case, if you've got 175,000 plus family caregivers, they need to know what they need to know if they're gonna get that job done for the older adults that they're responsible for. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and uh, motion on the floor with, with that direction. And uh, I look forward to uh, some further clarity about our AAA relationship. Thank you, Supervisor Lee, then Arenas. Sure, um, I don't really have a whole lot more to add. First of all, thank you so much for the uh, report, as it has certainly stating that family caregivers are, as we say, the backbone of every community's long-term care system. Uh, I myself and actually have to apologize to my parents. I'm a very bad one. My sister has done a lot of the caregiving for my octogenitarian, uh, uh, 80 year old parents. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's really clear the importance of the work uh, that we are doing in our community and also the gaps uh, in our system. And hopefully that this report that will be coming back to us in April will be able to uh, see those uh, answers being answered. So thank you very much for your good work and keep up. Thanks. Supervisor Arenas. Uh, thank you. Supervisor Simidian, could you repeat your um, motion, please? I'll try the short version. Um, move the recommended action with direction to staff to report back, follow up on and report back on um, the roles, responsibility, and funding commitment of our uh, area agency on aging um, and to have that conversation more fully developed at Children's Seniors and Family Committee. Also to direct staff that when we get the report back in April of 24, that we get a very focused report back on uh, issues of information and referral and respite, and that in the intervening months, those two issues become a focus of the work, and that we get uh, some additional understanding from the staff about what the resource needs will be, not just of the half dozen items that were listed in the report today at page three of four, but also the quote, several other recommendations that will require resources that do not yet exist. I think um, if we're gonna confront the challenge, we gotta confront the financial implications of the challenge. Thank you so much for being so thorough. Um, I'm absolutely gonna support this motion on the floor and I'll tell you that um, as I was listening to the presentation and, and just the conversation, uh, Supervisor Samidia and I, I, I really appreciate that you're focusing on those two items, the information referral and the rest, but I mean, I think there's a lot of really good recommendations overall, um, but I think it's really wonderful to have uh, two focuses, two or three focuses in that way, it becomes a little bit more doable and thank you all for the work that you're doing and for the study um, and what it's um, helping us understand um, further as we move along in our generations. Um, I am also Gen X, forgotten. Oh. <laughs> um, Welcome. Right. Um, and, and unfortunately, I've already gone through this with my parents. I've lost my mom about 20, more than 20 years ago, and my dad uh, shortly after. My dad lived with me for the last five years of his life. And so to have like, information and referral um, would have been just absolutely wonderful to have respite care. My dad was a very religious man, and let me tell you, what he preferred to do was read me the Bible all day long, <laughs> every weekend. So a little respite um, between my sisters is actually what we, what we did. Um, but not everybody has siblings, and not everybody has a network here. Um, and so I think those two things are just absolutely important in order, one, to take care of our next generation, and two, um, to take care of our own selves, because uh, caregiving is just absolutely hard. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so thank you for, for knowing that, that this is going to be difficult, uh, but that this is what our next generation is going to require of us, and we really need to stand up and do this for, for our seniors um, and, and for ourselves as well, right? I mean, we're, we're all gonna get to a certain point where we need a little bit of support. So thank you so much. Thank you. I will um, add my appreciation uh, for for the report. Look forward to um, to learning more about implementation as more information comes back. Uh, the key finding slide absolutely reflected the conversations that I had several weeks ago with a number of um, uh, county and county adjacent um, direct care direct caregivers and family caregivers, and it's. It's horribly sad and frustrating that we pay our caregivers um, amongst the lowest salaries, if not the lowest salaries um, in our county. I think um, they're, they're even behind, although very slightly behind childcare uh, providers, which is also a very um, political and real message as to the value that we actually place on caregiving. Um, so I'm very interested in, in seeing as we, as we move this forward, how we make sure that we are doing everything in, in our power. And I know that there are um, you know, state, st state set rates and other um, challenges that we have to address. But these are, this is the way people make a living. Um, and, and I think we have to work with them to understand how we can can do that in a sustainable way. Um, and finally, we're, we're going to do this at length at somebody's retirement party soon, but I wanted to just um, thank Diana, who I believe is presenting at, at your final meeting. It is. Is that correct? Yes. So I just wanted to make a, a quick um, public note of tremendous gratitude for your leadership, for your work and advocacy on behalf of older adults. We met through a, a mutual friend before I joined the Board of Supervisors, and before I knew it, I was becoming a dementia friend and uh, just learning so much from you from the very beginning. So there will be more to say soon, but I couldn't let the, the moment go by. So thank you again for the report. Thank you to, to all of you for this work. And really, we're all getting older if we're lucky. Mm -hmm. So we all have a vested interest in this work. We have heard uh, public comment on this item. We have a motion by Simidian, a second by Lee. Uh, we're going to vote on this item and then break for lunch. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Passes four to zero. Thank you very much. So it is 12.20. We will reconvene at 12.50 to handle items 12, 14, and 16 is what I have. Is that correct, Curtis? 12, 14, 16? And uh, 19, I believe. And 19. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much.
Hello, hello.
It is 12.50. As soon as we have a quorum, we'll recommence the meeting. Good afternoon. Uh, Peggy, will you take the role to establish the continued presence of a quorum? Good afternoon. Supervisor Arenas. Here. Supervisor Simidian is currently absent. Vice President Lee. Present. President Ellenberg. I'm here. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, our next item to hear is item 15. Uh, <laughs> That's quite the entrance. <laughs> um, <laughs> this uh, behavioral health report is shifting to a quarterly uh, cadence. The next report will be in November. I just want to lay out um, that my expectation is that the reports will become more standardized and structured around the five strategic priorities identified the department with inclusion of specific data as it becomes available, and FGOC will continue to monitor facility projects on a monthly uh, basis. Ideally, the September FGOC report will be streamlined to just a status list of projects for ease of reporting and review. So what I'd like to do is uh, hear the presentation, um, do go to public comment, and then come to each of my colleagues. Uh, I certainly could be mistaken, but I'm anticipating that there might be a good deal of conversation, and if that's the case, I would begin with 10-minute rounds for each of my colleagues um, moving down the line, beginning with Supervisor Lee. And if we need less than that, that's fine as well. Greta. Well, good afternoon, Supervisors, and if we could get the presentation pulled up, please. Okay, give us a moment. We are having a little bit of um, challenges in this presentation, I'll just add, because unfortunately both Keeley and Sherry Tarrow are, um, are out sick today, as well as a couple of other folks who are involved in the presentation. It sounds like we um, now have the person who will be casting our presentation. She's on her way, Greta. And so we will have the deck up in just a moment, um, but while we are waiting for that, um, I'll just go ahead and get started with a few introductory comments and then hopefully I can turn it over to the presenters. So we will have um, four focus areas for today's uh, quarterly update. One is on the School Link Services Program, a second on facility expansion efforts and progress um, following our last report to FGOC on that same topic. Um, a focus on departmental roles in substance use treatment and our service expansion in sets, as well as an update on our workforce expansion strategy for behavioral health. Um, one of the slides uh, included at the beginning of the slide deck also lists for reference by 
the board members as well as members of the public a number of um, off agenda and committee reports that provide further detail on ongoing efforts to improve and expand our behavioral health system of care. And so we'll plan to continue to include that slide as a reference point along with these quarterly reports. And with that, if we um, hopefully have the slide deck coming up, I will turn it over to Celia Freer Costa, who will um, take the lead in presenting the School Link Services portion of this presentation. Good afternoon, President Ellenberg and board members. <clears throat> My name is Zelia Costa with the Behavioral Health Services Department. And I'm gonna start with providing you an overview of the School Link Services um, Initiative. Could we advance the slides, please? Here is good, thank you. Um, the county established schooling services to increase students' access to a continuum of behavioral health services on school campuses. Schooling services is a partnership uh, between the county, school districts, and county contracted providers. The county facilitates and funds schooling services while the providers uh, provide the services um, on school campuses. Participating school districts also uh, hire schooling services coordinators who provide service coordination and linkages. Zelia, can we just um, interject to make sure that the slide deck is re-advanced? One more, Sheila. One more. Okay, right here. As of August of, uh, of this year, 2023, 25 of the 32 school districts in Santa Clara County are participating in the School Link Services Initiative. In FY23, School Link Services provided outreach and engagement to approximately 106,000 students and families and provided linkages and direct services to over 8,000 students and families. In FY24, the county will invest approximately $37.8 million in one-time and ongoing funds from all sources um, in SLS and another school-based behavioral health programs. Schooling services offers three service tiers. School districts, districts can choose whether to have one, two, or three service tiers. All 25 participating school districts receive tier one services um, and the county uh, provides all three uh, service tiers to 17 out of the 25 participating school districts. Next slide. <clears throat> the schooling services um, multi-tiered system of supports includes three different uh, levels or tiers. Uh, tier one is the family engagement and prevention, which provides universal supports and strategies uh, to all. Tier one activities include mental health screening, psychoeducation, outreach, school and classroom wide um, skill streaming, as well as family engagement and touch and refer. And refer. Uh, these services are primarily provided by paraprofessionals. Um, in tier two, uh, the early intervention uh, component of the MTSS model or framework um, provides more targeted services to um, supplemental support to address risk. Tier, tier two activities include skills groups, parenting workshops, case management and navigation, and behavioral support services. Um, in this tier, primarily uh, the services are also provided by paraprofessionals. And then the most intense or less tier is tier three for um, schooling services behavioral health. These services are provided to a selected um, a group of students for individual support to remediate significant challenges. Um, and these activities include individual group family therapy, targeted case management, as well as medication support and crisis intervention. The services here are provided by primarily um, clinicians. Next slide, please. Uh, you advanced too, too many. Yes, that one. This, <clears throat> this, uh, 
This here just illustrates um, the schooling services at a glance with more specific examples of what's included in tier one, two, and three um, services. So as you can see, family engagement includes activities such as one-time events or, or a series of events to welcome students and families on the school campuses, increase families' knowledge about um, available resources and services. They provide tools to improve their child's health and well-being, academic success, and their abilities to advocate for their child. Uh, schooling services coordinators are located on school campuses or school districts. They provide access to school-based services and community-based resources through linkages and referrals. Um, and prevention services include mental health screening, psychoeducation, skill streaming, um, and positive parenting, which we call Triple P Level 2. Under the Tier 2, uh, early intervention includes parenting workshops such as strengthening families and Triple P Level 3 individual and group um, therapy, case management, and family therapy and supports. Um, tier three is our most intensive services on school campuses, including individual and group therapy in school settings for schools experiencing moderate behavioral and emotional um, needs. Next slide. <clears throat> it is estimated that um, for tier one, or the universal supports, about 75 to 90% of students would be needing these services. Whereas for tier two, it would be about 10 to 25% of students uh, would need those services. And then for tier three, it's estimated that less than 10% of students would be needing uh, the tier three level of services. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, here we're just providing some highlights of um, uh, the services that were provided in FY23 uh, through, through the Tier 1 Family Engagement and Prevention. Um, so as you could see, in terms of uh, family engagement events uh, for students and families, we served about um, or over 63,000 families and students. Um, in terms of family engagement workshop series for students and families, uh, more than 13,000 or almost 14,000 participated in those types of events. 6,600 students um, successfully were linked up to services by our SLS coordinators and over 25,000 um, students and families uh, participated in prevention services. Of the 6,634 unduplicated students served through referral and linkage, 80.4% of those referrals were successfully linked to, to services. Um, and since FY22, student and family participation in family engagement events um, and the workshop series increased by 48%, which is very significant. Um, in FY23, 88% of surveyed families reported feeling more comfortable and welcomed at school, and 87% 87 of families indicated that the events and workshops allowed them to learn about available resources um, and services in the community. And 80% of the teachers were satisfied with the skill streaming lessons that were provided. Next slide. <clears throat> Here are some highlights for Tier 2 and Tier 3. Um, over 3,000 students were served under the PEI program for early intervention services. 954 were served uh, for individualized and group uh, therapy services. And 587 uh, students were served in the Tier 3 with a school-based behavioral health supports for individualized care, uh, more intensive supports. 83% of the students were successfully discharged from these programs upon satisfactory level of improvement and, satis and stabilization in their behavioral and emotional well-being. And students receiving therapeutic school-based behavioral health services showed improvement in their behavioral and emotional domain and life functioning domain as measured by the Child and Adolescent Needs and uh, Strengths Questionnaire, which is a, an assessment tool that we use at the beginning and ending of treatment. Next slide. <clears throat> In terms of next steps and future strategies, um, we will continue to outreach to the remaining seven school districts to implement the SLS initiatives at their um, school districts. 
we will increase positive parenting program through triple P level two and level three availability to more school districts. We will incorporate mental health screening for third graders increase skill, uh, skill groups availability for students to improve emotional well-being and expand the school linked uh, services behavioral health program to include more intensive uh, services and supports and this is also including newly identified um, high-risk zip codes we are continuously working with and engaging with Santa Clara County Office of Education um, uh, school districts and Medi-Cal managed care plans to implement the um, Children Youth Behavioral Health Initiative through strategies that include workforce expansion, informational technology enhancement, building stronger partnerships, um, and also includes uh, wellness centers. Uh, and as the school service fee schedule launches, which is uh, estimated to launch in January of 2024, we will continue to promote sustainability of wellness centers um, and schooling services and provide consultation to school districts and the managed care plans as their role will also increase uh, with the launch of the fee schedule. And I think I'm gonna turn this over now to Greta who will present the next section. Thank you, Zelia. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to be presenting uh, our section of the report on our facilities expansion efforts. And I just wanted to start by briefly hitting um, the three strategies that we're employing um, in order from fastest and least expensive to achieve to more, more expensive and more protracted in timeline. And so we're really um, prioritizing them in this order, in part given the urgency of um, expanding facility capacity. Next slide, please. Um, did want to just share some highlights of ongoing capacity expansion underway. Um, the first, as uh, several committees have already heard, is an expansion by San Jose Behavioral Health that will add 53 acute care beds, um, which, were which they're expecting to open in the coming weeks and months as they increase staffing. Um, but that facility is uh, fully um, constructed and ready for use, and so we expect these additional acute care beds to be coming online very soon. Um, we continue with very significant progress on the construction of the Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Facility, um, which is on the VMC campus. This photo is actually um, quite old at this point, given the rapid progress, so um, uh, we've been sharing uh, significant construction um, progress updates and our next milestone in that construction effort will be the topping out of the building when it reaches what will be its full height, which is imminent. Um, we have also increased the contracted rates to maintain access for subacute beds while we also um, focus uh, very specifically on our subacute expansion efforts because um, you know, it's critical that we're maintaining access to all the subacute beds currently in our inventory. Um, and then we're in ongoing negotiations, uh, which we hope will result in the addition very near term of 11 additional subacute beds in our community. Next slide, please. As the board well uh, knows well, we um, also added 40 community residential beds, um, 28 of which are at the new facility at 650 South Bascom, which we hope will be um, opening imminently. Uh, we're also supporting Pathways efforts to construct a new 30 bed SETS facility for which they received a significant state grant with our support. And so um, that will obviously take time to build and construct, but will be much needed. Um, and we are, uh, continuing to, well, at this point, uh, now have sort of um, run to ground our, our desire to continue some operation of the acute beds previously at Good Sam, um, which has now closed at this juncture. And, um, and so we'll continue to focus on how we can support the entire uh, community inventory of acute beds. We are currently, and if I can go to the next slide, um, evaluating 15 specific properties owned by the county for potential use for capacity bed expansion. Um, and these specific properties are listed here. Um, the first phase, which is now complete, was um, to identify those 15 sites, and now we're in the process of doing initial assessments to determine, in particular, 
whether and which of these may be suitable for a mental health rehabilitation center, since that subacute level of care is our most critical priority. Um, for those and other properties, we'll then be conducting um, the more in-depth feasibility study and planning process. And finally, for those that are not suitable for MHRC use, assessing these properties for potential use for other behavioral health related needs. Next slide, please. I also wanted to just briefly highlight um, our progress in expanding access to temporary shelter and permanent housing, since that's so critical for folks experiencing uh, mental illness and, and substance use related needs. Um, and, and I won't go into detail on, on reading kind of some of the, the highlights here, but did want to uh, likewise note for the board very significant progress on this front, which is really critical to us having those downstream support structures for folks who also um, are experiencing acute events that put them in these residential treatment programs that are quite scarce. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to be transitioning back over to our team, and I'll just um, ask if, you know, since the board's had um, access to the slides, just to hit the high points on each of the slides, we don't need to go through each of the um, points on the slides necessarily, but to just make sure um, we're hitting the high points as we also make sure there's time for questions. Thank you. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> So Behavioral Health is really committed to improving the substance use treatment services continuum of care. Um, and we have, the, have really looked at four primary objectives uh, to do this. One is to expand prevention services and increase awareness of the dangers of substance use, increase the number of um, individuals who access uh, substance use treatment services and programs, expand substance use programs, especially residential services, and improve timely access um, to care. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, we have com conceptualized the work in three main categories. Um, they are prevention, harm reduction, recovery um, services, and treatment services. Next slide. There are several departments that play uh, significant roles in the development and provision of these services. Um, and on behalf of the county, um, the Behavioral Health Services Department serves as the managed care plan for substance use uh, treatment services. Uh, the department ensures that Medi-Cal beneficiaries and uninsured individuals, individuals have access to a continuum of medically necessary services and as a result is central to leading um, coordinating efforts to improve county sets programs. However, given the complexity and the prevalence of substance use disorders and structure of the county, other health system departments also play key roles. In prevention, behavioral health and the public health department play key roles in public awareness campaigns, provided trainings, etc. Under harm reduction, um, Efforts are being focused on distributing naloxone. Um, many uh, county departments assist in ensuring their sites, programs, um, or partners have access to uh, naloxone and fentanyl strips uh, to be distributed. <clears throat> uh, the, the Behavioral Health Services Department also is the coordinator of SCOOP or the Santa Clara County Opioid Overdose Prevention Project. Um, and public health uh, mobile syringe and alternatives to injections program is also another key uh, harm reduction program in the county. Next slide. <clears throat> Under treatment services, I think you might have advanced one too many. <clears throat> Sally, I think you might have um, an older version of the slide deck. Um, just based on the order you were going through it, so you may just want to look at the screen. I see, okay. So um, under treatment services, um, of course the Behavioral Health Services Department plays a significant role because we are the provider for treatment services in delivering a continuum of outpatient services and residential services um, and narcotic treatment programs, which are specialized medication assistant treatment services. Santa Clara Valley Healthcare provides such outpatient services to patients of its clinics uh, through the Valley Health um, Homeless Healthcare Program. And Santa Clara Valley Healthcare also provides highly accessible outpatient services to unhoused individuals. 
The hospitals can also provide medical detoxification services to patients who are admitted for concurrent acute medical needs. And finally, uh, Custody Health uh, provides substance use treatment services to incarcerated adults, and Behavioral Health provides um, youth services at Juvenile Hall and also at the James Ranch. Um, and then under recovery, uh, traditionally meant uh, peer-to-peer individualized and group-based case management to support to help individuals avoid a relapse or quicker recovery from one. Recovery services are primarily delivered through behavioral health and its contractors, but can also be provided by other departments. Next slide. <clears throat> there are a series of activities and services um, in development uh, for each of the categories that I mentioned. Um, and so under the treatment expansion, um, Behavioral Health has started a biweekly uh, SUDS redesign work group that started in June of 2023. Um, and this work group has convened to discuss um, uh, the, this concept of having FSP, an FSP program in the substance use treatment services. Um, it's also uh, discussing walk-in and same-day same access to SUDS outpatient services um, and increasing SUDS and mental health services for individuals and in shelters in partnership with Santa Clara Valley Healthcare. Uh, we're also exploring models for a potential outpatient uh, withdrawal uh, hub clinic expanding uh, addiction medicine consultation access, uh, and also uh, under the Valley Health um, Homeless Project, contingency management at the Alexian Clinic is estimated to be launched in early 2024. The Public Health Department is working to develop a contract with Bright uh, Heart Health for access to a expanded medication-assisted treatment via telehealth, and Custody Health is currently participating in statewide initiatives to explore funding opportunities to enhance access to services and care upon release. <clears throat> Under prevention and recovery, um, services in development include uh, through funds from the Opioid Settlement Fund investments, um, with public, with behavioral health, we'll have a public communications campaign, training primary uh, care physicians, integrating supports with local city governments to spread awareness, um, utilization of peers at schools. And under public health, they have applied for the limiting overdose through collaborative actions and localities grant, which will establish online research hubs um, training for first responders, providing best practice, creating overdose surveillances, um, et cetera. Next slide. Okay, next slide will be for Darren. Good afternoon, President Allenberg and members of the board. Um, I also have with me Lisa Wilmis from our Behavioral Health Contractors Association who will be co-presenting our uh, workforce updates, uh, uh, addressing uh, strategic priority number four of our public health crisis. Uh, I wanted to provide a quick refresher from our last report out and a couple of highlights relating to this year's objectives um, of the four established goals that we've identified um, to tackle our workforce um, shortage. Uh, the first is to enhance and leverage partnerships. The second is to strengthen the workforce pipeline and recruitment. Third is to promote the behavioral health field. And fourth is to conduct a workforce analysis. And um, some key areas that we're focusing on this year as it relates to these strategies are um, you know, filling our newly created licensed clinical supervisor positions, uh, exploring the feasibility of providing enhanced sign-on bonuses, um, and working in partnership with consultants who produce a statewide behavioral health workforce study um, that will develop a strate strategic plan um, locally to systematic systematically address our workforce shortage. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, slide really just talks about some of the accomplishments that we were able to um, achieve uh, as it relates to our four strategies uh, from the last fiscal year. A couple of key highlights that I wanted to um, kind of uh, bring to your attention is uh, last year we did uh, implement a few uh, different initiatives for our department. Um, 
One was the sign-on bonus, which we were able to distribute 34 sign-on bonuses for our clinical positions. Another was um, our ability to fill 11 PSW slash MFT positions, which are our clinical um, positions, uh, through a streamlined one requisition hiring process. Um, and uh, another um, item was we were able to retain eight interns in the full-time unclassified rehabilitation counselor code uh, so that those interns can maintain permanent employment as they transition into qualifying into a psychiatric social worker or a marriage and family therapist. Um, one more highlight I'd like to also um, bring to your attention is uh, in uh, enhancing and leveraging partnerships, we were able to work with various schools um, and engaged over 200 high school students, uh, 148 of which wanted to learn more about behavioral health as a result. Next slide, please. Um, and as part of our workforce analysis, uh, this was a continuation of our report back in April, um, and I'm uh, pleased to report that from uh, April to the end of last fiscal year, both our field department positions and department vacancy rate um, have continued to display positive trends. Um, so we've filled more positions from April to now um, and also lowered our vacancy rate. Um, from the beginning of the fiscal year last year, we were at 23%. Um, and as of the end of the fiscal year, we brought it down to about 18%. So um, we are making incremental progress in our vacancy. Next slide, please. Um, and so uh, before I hand it over to Lisa, I wanted to uh, present this slide to um, uh, show the board that we did conduct an initial survey with our Behavioral Health Contractors Association um, just to identify uh, the monthly hires that our collective uh, providers um, were able to fill and also uh, the cumulative total of vacancies that they've had. So the hiring trends differed by agency, but there was a slight increase in both hiring um, and vacancies towards the end of quarter four uh, for fiscal year 2023. Um, again, circling back to uh, the strategic priority um, to improve upon this we, and re refine this analysis, we will be working with UCSF uh, who, re who conducted a statewide analysis of um, the behavioral health workforce back in 2018. Um, so we're very excited to start work with uh, uh, this partnership with UCSF. Next slide. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Ellenberg and distinguished members of the board. My name is Lisa Wilmis. My pronouns are she and her. And I work for the Behavioral Health Contractors Association, affectionately referred to as BHCA. I am honored to be here with you today to provide this update. I'd like to start by emphasizing the importance of incorporating youth voices, expertise, and knowledge in designing the school outreach that Darren described to you a moment ago. We are proud to have connected Kaiser with Aki's Youth in Technology program. Their $24,000 grant afforded the youth in the program to develop a sleek and interactive slide deck to be used during our classroom presentations. Presenters from the work group include therapists, case managers, interns, peers, and policy analysts sharing about their different roles in behavioral health and paths to employment, education, and internships. The Youth and Technology Program, in partnership with MACLA, will develop two day-in-the-life short videos to highlight staff and entry-level positions, featuring a peer worker from the Downtown Youth Wellness Center, a staff member from the Trust Crisis Response Team, and a client sharing a positive experience with a case manager or peer support worker. These videos will be completed by December and shown during outreach presentations. The videos will also be posted to social media accounts of providers, hopefully the county, and as well as some youth influencers. <laughs> Funding from the Community Foundation of Silicon Valley allowed BHCA to launch a workforce pipeline project focused on developing pathways into the field through free and low cost certification programs. Based on our research on best practices around the state, we have instigated exciting efforts in our county. In fall 2024, San Jose City College, Mission, and Gavilan will launch behavioral health certification programs that can be completed in one to two semesters. The course subjects have been identified by practitioners in the field who strongly emphasize the need to prepare staff to work with high acuity clients, manage heavy caseloads, and understand documentation standards. From this perspective, it will help address the recruitment and retention challenges the county and agencies face. 
This summer, in partnership with San Jose City College and the fabulous staff at Community Solutions, we launched a pilot program with 13 peers and youth who participated in a two-week skills building course, followed by a six-week paid internship experience. Students received an introduction to a multitude of behavioral health topics, including trauma-informed care, youth mental health first aid, culturally informed practices, and law and ethics. As part of their internship at Community Solutions, inter interns worked with teams providing services to build their professional and clinical skills. One student said, quote, I feel this increased my ability to do effective and empathetic behavioral health work. It has also increased my potential by giving me the tools to properly care for myself as I navigate challenges, end quote. We all learned so much from this experience and we are planning to make improvements for the next cohort. The state is making significant investments in workforce and we are seeing the benefits locally. Palo Alto University applied and received funding to create a new Master of Social Work program. The next application cycle opens in January 2024 and we hope other local institutions will take advantage of the funding. State funding was also awarded to BHCA member organizations thanks to HKI's mentored internship program, which aims to provide students at multiple stages of their education an opportunity to gain practical on-the-job experience. Community Solutions brought on 60 interns and hired 20 into permanent positions. Rebecca Children's Services was able to bring on 20 master-level interns and four bachelor-level level interns. They hired a total of F, uh, 10 FTEs from this first round as clinical counselors and IHBS worker. This fall, they will bring on an additional 16 interns. Gardner Health Services brought on 18 interns with five hired into therapist positions. And HealthRight 360 had six interns and were able to hire two as group counselors, three as clinical therapists, and are preparing for an additional eight interns this fall. Through another state program, Alum Rock Counseling Center is receiving funding for the next three years to provide loan forgiveness and retention bonuses for staff, as well as for um, intern stipends. BHCA is looking forward to our continued partnership with the county. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who is part of this presentation and I'll just give particular thanks to the several folks who are filling in for folks who are expecting to be here presenting today, um, but who are out sick. So um, really appreciate that and also really appreciate the update from BHCA. So thank you so much for joining our presentation and board members, I hope um, that although um, the progress on many of these fronts is um, slow and tedious that uh, it's also clear that we're making really significant progress notwithstanding the fact that there's so much work that still remains to be done on all of these fronts and with that we will await your questions thank you very much uh, Peggy is helping me wipe up my tea that I spilled but what I would like to do public comment first before we go to the board do we have any speakers in chambers or on zoom Yes, we have one speaker in chambers and one virtual speaker. Our speaker in chambers is Paul Soto. You may begin, sir. Thank you. Paul Soto there isn't enough time to flesh out each one of these issues. I think that that in itself is an issue, is that you need to hear from the public and to say that there's two minutes to speak on this kind of issue, considering that it's a public health issue, considering the amount of fentanyl deaths that are going on on the street, I think it's disrespectful to give the public only two minutes to talk on this particular item. I would like to thank the person that is creating that, um, that uh, program where the person only has to do one or two semesters because we are the professionals. We are the ones that have experienced the generational impacts of the neglect of these policies. We literally are the experts in the rooms. I almost died. I was, uh, when, I, when I saw that sign of uh, the 87 uh, being built, eight weeks ago I was living under that bridge. Eight weeks ago. Supervisor Lee's office, if it wasn't, I wouldn't be alive today. 
if it wasn't for Supervisor Lee's office. From June 14th to July 18th, I was on the streets sleeping in doorways, and he found out, he got a first-hand look at how difficult it is to get somebody like me. I'm here every single week, and I couldn't get into these places. So some of the information is just simply not true. It's not correct. We do not have access. It took his office that long. So thank you to Kevin Lee and Alika. I literally, and because, because of that deficit that's been created generationally, I had three ambulance rides to the hospital. I nearly died because my blood pressure was at stroke level and I was a victim of a violent crime. And I had that police report still in my wallet. If it was not for Supervisors Lee's, and, and, and even him, he's, he's found and saw how the system just like, wow, this is difficult to navigate. We do not have that access. So we need to be more comprehensive in terms of how we implement these policies because there's a disconnect between application and, and concept. And we have one virtual speaker, Blair Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Yeah, this is a comprehensive, important work that's defining, you know, uh, our past decade and, and how we move into the future. So thank you for all of your efforts on these items. Uh, the words of Paul Soto is incredibly important to hear each individual person and their story and their understanding and, and to put that into how to create a future mental health process that uh, really respects the rights of the individual. Um, that's really key, and I think you're trying to learn how to do that. Just good luck in those continued good efforts. This had a lot of information uh, today, so so a real good luck to, to hear individual cases and really know how to put that into uh, what we're building with this program. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much. I will look down the, um, uh, down the, what is this, the dais. <laughs> Uh, for my colleagues' comments. Uh, Supervisor Lee, let's begin with you. And I'm going to ask, just anticipating um, what may be a lot of comments, let's set the timer for 10 minutes, and we'll do as many rounds as are needed. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the good report. I did actually bring my report with me um, uh, and uh, was listening uh, very carefully to, first of all, it was very, very comprehensive. It was very helpful to see all the various things that we're doing uh, as a county and, and certainly is hitting so many important spots. Um, with regard to the schooling services initiative, um, I just would like to bring attention to some of the items uh, and request the administration to uh, work on an off-the-agenda report to address some of these concerns. The first item is about the variations in roles and responsibilities of the SLS coordinators at the school districts. Um, all the SLS coordinators split their time to provide service coordination and family engagement activities. Um, some have the McKinley Vento Liaison responsibilities in addition to the SLS work. Uh, in addition, all SLS coordinators are also expected to hold campus collaborative meetings with the different stakeholders to support service coordination and family engagement services on this regular basis. Um, that certainly is a lot of important work, but that's also a lot for these coordinators. Um, and that this <coughs> workload does not seem to allow for these coordinators to engage and do some of the follow-up uh, needed to serve these communities. So um, what I would like to see, if I could request that in an off agenda report to provide information on ways to standardize the SLS coordinators' roles and responsibilities to uh, something a bit more manageable um, as we continue to expand to more uh, school districts uh, as we move forward. The second item is that we have heard anecdotally about some uh, pay inequities issues among these coordinators. Uh, of pretty significant five digits in salary differences. Um, I understand that each district has discretion for pay range of the coordinator, but certainly would like to see if we could uh, be, do some more equitable options to deal with these pay equities issues uh, so that the standards and the rules and expectations are actually the same. Third item is about the service coordination and addressing the root causes of issues for students and their families through the linkage to mental health services, social services, housing, transportation, food, immigration, which are core to the work that the SLS coordinators do. And family engagement, as we know, is really important to the SLS initiative, but the SLS coordinators also acknowledge that students and families are less likely to engage in these family engagement activities, so these basic needs are not met. 
So I certainly would like to ask the administration to also explore shifting family engagement funds over to service coordination funds, or if any additional funding may be needed to come back during our mid-year budgeting uh, process. Fourth item I want to mention is that one school district has noted that they need more PEI behavioral health slots since some students don't qualify for SLS behavioral health or Medi-Cal billing here. Another school district also noted that they don't have available PEI behavioral health slots since they were filled up over the summer and those students are continuing services until the fall, which of course is a good thing. Uh, I request the administration to work with these school districts uh, and to include information on how to address outstanding needs for behavioral health slots. So uh, in summary, if I may, uh, President Allenberg, I would like to make a motion and the request to, to receive this report and also requesting the following information be addressed in the off-agenda off report. That is, ways to standardize SOS coordinated roles and responsibilities to something more manageable uh, while we continue with the other school districts. Options for pay equity for the SRS coordinators if all standards and roles and expectations are the same. Three is shifting the family engagement funds over to service coordination funds with feedback on whether or not additional funding might be needed to come back during our mid-year budget and also request administration work with the school districts to include information on how to address outstanding needs for behavioral health slots. Is that clear? Thank you, Supervisor. Yes, that's clear. And um, just for members of the public who are listening who may have less familiar, familiarity with our School Link Services programs, um, the School Link Services coordinator positions you mentioned, as, as you indicated, are positions um, that are, are employees of the school districts. And so the county has less um, capacity and control over some of the factors that you mentioned than we would certainly if they were our own employees. We can absolutely come back with an off-agenda report that um, provides information and talks about our influence over some of the issues that you've talked about. Okay, thank you very much. I'm happy to second, second your motion, Supervisor. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, on the SLS issue, on, should I also talk about the issue relating to SETS as well right now, or would that be okay? Okay, so uh, moving on the substance use treatment services, I certainly very much appreciate the administration's uh, outlining the roles of the county health systems department and services in development. Um, this is now the second time, I believe at least, that the board has seen the information on substance use treatment, services and dev development, and I see that this is certainly a good start of our framework um, of expanding our substance use services continuum. So what I would like to see is ask the administration to create an Im implementation timeline for each service listed on slide 23 with each county department's roles and responsibilities and report back at the next public health crisis report on November 7th. I would also like to express that I'm truly excited for all these services. I just have no idea how to convey my constituents exactly how we're going to get all these services started when, and when they should expect to see them available. Um, slide 22 mentions that the Santa Clara County Opioid Overdose Prevention Project, also known as SCOOP, this project is coordinated by the Behavioral Health Services Department, but we also have the Drug Users Health Advisory Council that is convened by the Public Health Department's Harm Reduction Program to provide feedback on agency policies regarding drug users in communities served by our county. We also have a fentanyl task force to gather stakeholders and discuss recommendations to address fentanyl crisis and the rise in the fatal overdoses. Now, we certainly have multiple work groups with similar stakeholders and organizations aimed at one main issue, which is, of course, the substance use services and the overdose and related issues. So I would like to ask the administration to look into the roles of these different work groups and bring recommendations for consolidation or streamlining to avoid the stovepipe uh, effect to the board during the next public health crisis report on November 7th. And may I add that to my motion? Yes. Okay. And would you second it? No, that's <laughs> why I meant. Yes, I will. That's Thank second you. is fine. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Supervisor Simidian, do you have anything to add on this item? No. Nope. Supervisor Arenas. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the, um, the very thorough update. Um, one of the um, updates that I really enjoyed listening to was the school link services. As you know, that's where our kids spend most of our time and so I think it's just absolutely important and crucial for us to really get into their environment. Um, 
we can't always expect our parents and our families to understand our systems and understand how to get to us. Uh, and so as much as we can get to them, I think that's, that's the most effective um, strategy um, because we have some very captive audiences <laughs> at our school sites, right? Um, I had a question about that, and I was wondering about the reduction in Tier 3 benefits. Um, and I think those, the, those that are returning to not covering kids under who don't have Medi-Cal, can you talk a little bit more about that? Am I understanding correctly? Could you repeat it? I'm sorry, I could not. Um hear you very clearly. Sure. The Tier 3 support service that um, ended in July um, and is not, that was covering children who didn't have Medi-Cal, non-Medi-Cal students. What, what is the update? What are we doing? I think what you may be referring to is a 10% increase that we uh, provided our um, contracted providers um, in August of, I believe it was a motion here at this meeting, August of 2021, and we um, increased uh, our contracts for both uh, prevention and early intervention and the school-based program by 10% to support with the COVID recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and so that 10% was being utilized to provide services to all students, regardless of yes. um, their insurance status. So since then, we have uh, we maintained the 10% in the contracts, but we converted those funds to expand um, capacity to pro to provide services um, to students. <clears throat> so you in, you continue to include the ten percent on an ongoing basis. Yes, and and so you are making it um, available for those students that uh, fall into that category of non medical. No, they were for medical beneficiaries. They were always for medical beneficiaries. No, the the um, when we kept the ten percent on, it was for Medi-Cal beneficiaries. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. So you kept the ten percent on. And yeah, it just was for a period of time. It was like a, it was supposed to be one-time funding mm -hmm. to support all students, and then since then we've converted those ten percent to expand just capacity in general for those programs. Mm -hmm. um, and how many students did that impact? I wouldn't be able to tell you. It would be really great to figure that piece out. I, I would really hate to the, have some of these students that are kind of in between. You know, they're not quite at whatever federal poverty level or they don't qualify for Medi-Cal for whatever reason or they have it I, whatever, for whatever reason or they have a private insurance who is overwhelmed, uh, whose system is overwhelmed and um, don't have the, the capacity to provide whatever support services that we were providing, or just don't. Um, and those are the kiddos that I'm afraid that will fall into through the cracks. Um, can you come back and or an off agenda report and include that? And I would love to see that as a, included in our motion. Supervisor Arenas, what I can say is that um, the 10% in the PI program was expanded for universal strategies, so those students would continue to benefit from tier one and tier two supports. And really what we're trying to do with the MTSS framework is really um, prevent students from needing that tier three, so all students can benefit from tier one and tier two. Uh, I, so it's only a select number of students, you know, the less than 10% that I was mentioning earlier in the sure. slide. Uh, but that's the, that's the percentage that <clears throat> you normally would really worry about. Sure. Because 80 to 90% of our children are okay, or at least before the pandemic they were okay. I don't know how they're faring after the pandemic, and I, if, if I were to guess, I'm sure that it's, it's a larger percentage that's having a difficult time 
readjusting to a society that is now allowing us to reconnect. Mm -hmm. So I would like to figure out what that, um, that number is and if we could include that um, update in the motion. Uh, is this Supervisor Lee? Mm -hmm. Hi. <laughs> would you? Are you approving that as part of your motion, Supervisor Lee? Yeah, I will. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, next, I'm going to move on to the substance abuse treatment services. And I know I, we heard something opposite of what I'm going to say right now in a previous uh, public comment. Uh, but a lot of our South County folks need additional services and support. It's, a, it's an area that's been underserved for many years. Um, and we do have some uh, people in Gilroy who are interested in um, uh, rehabilitation services to, to Gilroy. Um, and it looks like there might be uh, a couple of uh, SUTS uh, treatment site expansions. Can you talk a little bit about that? On, I think it's on county-owned land. Sure, happy to speak to that briefly. Um, we definitely do have a number of sites in South County where we're currently providing substance use treatment services and, and um, have been looking to support expansions there and elsewhere. And um, happy to also come back off agenda with any additional details on specifically um, how we see uh, expanding access in South County fitting into our broader framework for substance use treatment service capacity expansion. That, that would be wonderful, and as you know, we had earlier in, in the summer, we had five overdoses of fentanyl wow. um, out in the Gilroy area, and um, I, you know, we're, we're all just very concerned, and Gilroy is so far away from San Jose, I can't, I, and now I appreciate that at a very deep level. Um, when I'm going in between meetings. And so I'm just going in between meetings, but our families, you know, are coming here for services that are so dire. Um, so I really appreciate that, Greta. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to extend as well my appreciation for the, for the, presentation today and for the um, really detailed and informative uh, slide deck and ledge file. I want to pick up on the workforce uh, issue. It, it really is, is critical and I had a conversation last night with a number of um, uh, providers and workforce is at the very top of their list uh, for need. I'm wondering if you can provide some more detail on the scope and timeline of the study with UCSF? And, and will it be comparable to the, um, the workforce study that was uh, conducted by the San Diego County? Hi, President Ellenberg. Yes, uh, we're, we're in the final stages of um, securing our partnership with UCSF, and so we expect to start work in October. Um, as far as the San Diego study, that was an example we presented to UCSF as a study we wanted to potentially model some aspects of. Um, the study that they conducted in 2018 was very comprehensive, but we felt like with the pandemic and also five years being passed since that extensive study, this was an opportunity for us to provide um, not only an update on what this, the workforce looks like, but a localized kind of um, assessment so that we can develop our strategic plan and work closely with our partners um, from the BACA. Thanks, so I, I hear October. And can you, is the scope going to parallel San Diego? Is our scope broader, narrower? Once we are able to finalize our, our um, agreement with UCSF, we will start to engage in conversations to talk about the scope. But the intention is to really look at San Diego's model and, and identify the same. Okay, that's so interesting to me that you finalize the agreement first and then determine the scope rather than know what the scope of the project is and then engage someone? I'm sorry, uh, to clarify, I'm not finalizing the scope. It's, it's uh, really to look at the different sets of data that we wanted to have UCSF uh, assess um, with our partners and, and the department as well. Greta, is there anything you want to add to that? Thank you. 
I don't have much to add on the okay. description of the UCSF um, study, but Darren, I don't. Maybe I'll just um, frame a question to you. It sounds it sounds like the partnership with UCSF is mature enough that you're at the phase where you're trying to make sure they have the data they need and to then utilize the set of data to um, describe what scope they can complete given, given the, the data, data they will have access to. Is that is that am I understanding that correctly? That that is correct. Thank so you. So the current data is determining the scope. Yes, and okay. so it, 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 it will inform what they're able to do and then allow us to finalize that scope. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. both of you. Um, as well as hearing about workforce challenges, um, I'm hearing concerns from providers and partners about the statewide challenges in getting uh, CalAIM enhanced care management and community supports uh, implemented broadly to as many residents uh, who are eligible as possible. I know, I know we're having some of these same issues locally as was referenced earlier in the VHHP report. Um, and discussions at reentry. What what can can any of you say just briefly about the strategies that we are implementing um, to to really ensure that everyone who's eligible for services is connected to them? Um, I was actually going to say I don't know Paul if if you're able to come and and if I could just take a moment while Paul's approaching the dais to also just thank. Um, Paul for his presence and, and also Dr. Redman who's here. We weren't sure if there were gonna be questions about um, either the hospital and clinics component of our substance use treatment work as well as public health. So they're both here Great. present and available to answer questions. Um, but on the work to maximize our use of a lot of the expanded service capacity under CalAIM, I think Paul's probably the best person to speak to that. Great. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, President Ellenberg, uh, for the question. So. What we're learning early on is some of the information relative to patient eligibility um, is not current. And so as you noticed in the Valley Homeless Program report, the 1,200 individuals referred to the program, there has been challenges in locating, identifying them relative to where, where they're at within our community. Um, and, and so one of the important things to remember from a CalAIM perspective, it is early on. And as a system, what we're trying to do is take that information and aggressively go after and identify individuals that are actually eligible for services and get them into case management. Um, and I think we're doing a really good job in that. As you noted in the report, we had close to 5,000 contacts or efforts to initiate engagement. Um, and even with that level of engagement and outreach, we only had close to 133 enrolled in the program. So I think there's a disconnect between the individuals that are being identified by the plans and then our ability to outreach and engage them. Um, and so that is where our effort is, is focused on trying to, to really reach out and enroll them into the program and provide that enhanced case management. Uh, there are a number of different subpopulations that we're gonna be focusing on which includes uh, justice-involved indi individuals. That's the program that we're currently planning to bring to your board in terms of our strategies to, to engage that population early. Um, early before they leave custody. Correct. Um, and, and so a lot of our effort is around still planning around the data and the information that we have. Um, clearly, as you will note, um, and, and as you understand, our effort is to make sure that when we have an individual in our care, anywhere in our system, that we provide that level of care and case management that uh, they're entitled to. Um, so it is a very labor intensive process um, in terms of outreach and engagement, but I think we're making good progress where we do have good information. Is the, thank you for all of that, Paul. Is the, is the broad discrepancy, the very wide discrepancy between the number of people that you've touch the 5,000 number and the number that have enrolled, would you attribute that more to a trust issue or is are we identifying the wrong people and they're not actually eligible? So from what I've gathered in, in terms of speaking with individuals, um, as your board is well aware, we're going through a redetermination process. There right. are many individuals that are in the Medi-Cal roles that 
as we go through this process, will find that are no longer in the area, mm -hmm. uh, are no longer eligible for, for so Medi-Cal for issues, other reasons sir. in terms Got of it. criteria. So when we received the list, for example, in the homeless program, that list was from January of, of this year. And we're already close to eight months into the year. So you can imagine the individuals coming on and off the Medi-Cal roles. And, and so it's really important that we all understand that we're moving forward relative to getting more current data in terms of eligibility. Thanks. And so we have eligibility workers not directly affiliated with the hospital system at all, but eligibility workers in our, in our social services agency getting people connected to CalFresh and CalWorks. Are they also doing the Medi-Cal and CalAIM and enhanced care eligibility? And on your end, if you get somebody for um, Medi-Cal, CalAIM, extended enhanced benefits, are you also connecting them with uh, CalFresh or CalWorks or anything else they might be entitled to receive? So the social services agency is responsible for determining someone's eligibility into any one of the programs that you had mentioned. Um, and specific to Medi-Cal eligibility, because individuals were not going through the redetermination process, the health plans did not have current information relative to their current active participation. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. The, the social services agency plays a critical role in terms of actual technical eligibility. Then it's up to the plans and the healthcare system to make sure that, in fact, they're receiving services and are eligible for services relative to, to that notice. Um, I'm not sure if that made any sense, but it's a very, you know, you know, they first have to determine eligibility before we get notice that they potentially would be eligible for right, CalAIM right. and enhanced, enhanced case management. It, make, it, it does make sense. I'm envisioning a flow chart that I need to draw out, but that, that is helpful. And I would just note generally for folks, there was a fantastic article in CalMatters, I think yesterday, uh, on the impact of the number of people that would be lifted out of poverty if they were currently enrolled in all the benefits that they are actually entitled to today. So I know it's a different topic, I won't introduce it here, but really thinking about our investment in, in eligibility, Medi-Cal, every, every service, and how much that really serves our own bottom line, frankly, and stabilizes families, I think is, is really significant. I'm about to be out of time. I had a couple more questions, but let me first look down the line. Does anybody else want a second round before I continue? <laughs> Dude, thank you. <laughs> but, but Supervisor Lee and Arenas, are, are you okay if, if I continue? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to pivot then to, did, did you want to say something about eligibility? Um, I, I'm happy to just say I have a couple comments on just some of the things we've been discussing, but I can hold it till the end and, and hit all of them, including that point, if okay, you'd like. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to look um, to support Supervisor Lee, particularly around the substance use uh, treatment planning. Um, I, I also have really been excited to see the aspirations in the, in the early planning, and I'm also looking forward to a clear implementation plan that, that delineates assigned roles for departments and some expected timelines uh, to launch the services that are outlined here. Um, again, Supervisor Lee, uh, I, I too would like to see some, so, some coordinated uh, planning as a, as a whole of county effort. I think the framework of roles of departments is a good start. But again, we need to see that uh, operationalized and certainly to include EMS uh, directly in the effort. Um, and I'm delighted that public health is, is playing um, a larger role in this. I don't have a direct question for you, Dr. Redmond, but I'm very glad you're here and, and part of this. Uh, and, and finally, um, just want to thank all of the folks that are involved with uh, advocacy at the state level on behavioral health issues. We, our, our county really is, um, is a, bo both a model and a testing ground for a wide range of policies and opportunities. So we are continuously making sure that we are positioning ourselves um, 
in a position um, as subject matter experts, as very willing partners in um, in thinking through how to best deliver services to the greatest number of people. We have a motion by Lee, a second by myself. We've heard public comment. I don't see lights on. I'm going to go to uh, Greta, and then we will vote on this item. Um, well, one, I just wanted to thank the board um, for your comments and specifically say um, on the schooling services work and the prevention and early intervention work of the behavioral health department more generally, one area where um, I think we're trying to stay focused as we also really try to build out our deep end system of care is on that prevention and early intervention work. And I know the board has long championed that work. We will continue to invest heavily in that work. But um, it's also an area where as um, very well-intentioned reforms have been proposed at the state level, as um, many members of the board are well aware, uh, some of those efforts would divert some of the existing funding streams that we've long used from MHSA specifically to support prevention and early intervention towards um, housing and other more deep end, adult end um, of the system of care where there absolutely is more investment needed, but continuing to strike um, the fine balance between trying to prevent um, young members of our community from in adulthood needing those deep end services just has to be a continued focus for our county. Um, and so making sure that we continue to advocate that state efforts to really invest um, on these issues in the way that we have invested as a county don't end up um, backfiring intergenerationally and in creating even worse problems um, at the adult end of the care spectrum for people who are currently um, uh, young members of our community. Um, on the substance use uh, coordination, I am really excited about the interdepartmental work that's happening on this front, and I'll just express gratitude to public health, to the hospital and clinic system of care, for a lot of our um, physician and clinical leaders who've really leaned in to play a broader systems leadership role in that space and will continue to do so. And we're really excited to bring forward further detail on those fronts. I will um, say that we will do our, our level best to come back with um, specific timelines and more detailed implementation plans, um, but that uh, there are some limitations in what we, how specific we can be on that front, given um, some of the unknowns that we're looking into, particularly, for example, on um, the facilities front, where some of these programs would um, be operationalized, so we will come back with as much information as we can and will have at that juncture for sure. Um, and uh, finally, just on the um, question around benefits eligibility, there's um, also some really wonderful interdepartmental work happening on that front, very consistent with your comment, Supervisor Ellenberg. Um, we've been very laser focused in administration on the notion of how do we, in a very complex context of lots of state reforms affecting benefits eligibility, the process for enrolling people in benefits, really try and level up our efficacy, capacity, and processes for supporting people in benefits enrollment. And um, this has been presented to um, some of the board's committees, but there's really wonderful work happening um, in the health system to support patients of the system who may be more receptive to and open to contact from their care provider than they might be from their health plan or from the social services agency to help support them in submitting a complete application for Medi-Cal redetermination. Um, and so that uh, that work is, is ongoing and really great early success from that effort and efforts that we want to continue to expand. Um, but I would also just say, you know, it, um, it, it, it is wonderful to see lots of reforms afoot, but also complicated. And so on the benefits enrollment front, as, as the state has um, made a fabulous change that requires, as, as um, social services is helping support someone in Medi-Cal enrollment, them to also offer and support simultaneous enrollment in CalFresh, which we hope will really increase what I think are 
um, significant under-enrollment in CalFresh for members of our county community. Um, also complexity in the new CalSAS system that folks are having to use simultaneous with the big push on redetermination. So lots of opportunities, but also lots of challenges um, and things that are being worked on simultaneously that are quite complex to manage. So just appreciate the board's continued engagement as we um, navigate very, um, very choppy waters on a lot of these fronts. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I realize I referenced the VHHP um, report, which we haven't actually heard yet, but we're going to do that next. Uh, Peggy, let's vote on this item, please. Supervisor Arenas. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice Chairperson, excuse me, Vice President Lee. Aye. And President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. We're um, doubling back to item 12, which is the Valley Homeless Health Care Program monthly report. And thank you all to the behavioral health folks. Thank you, President Ellenberg and members of the board. Uh, once again, Paul Lorenz, Chief Executive Officer for Santa Clara Valley Healthcare. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce you to Christy Rouse. Christy Rouse is our Assistant Nurse Manager for the Healthcare for the Homeless program. She's been with the program since 2016. Uh, so she's very well versed in the program and many of our services that we offer our uh, patients. Uh, as you well know in this report, we have a couple of updates, uh, referrals, one on the substance use treatment activities of the Valley Homeless Program, and as well as an update on the enhanced case management services related to Cal AIM. Uh, the other item in this report uh, reflects uh, a recommendation that your board support uh, the addition of additional specialties, uh, uh, both medicine and surgical specialties uh, at our FQHC locations throughout the county uh, in terms of uh, a change in scope. Uh, that will allow us to bill uh, for those services, but the true intent is to extend these specialty services at our health centers. And as most of you know, the vast majority of our specialty services are at Valley Specialty Center. We're in the effort and have implemented a strategy to expand those services, not just at the health centers throughout the county, but also at uh, the Morgan Hill site, as well as the campuses at O'Connor Hospital and St. Louis Hospital. So it really does allow us to further bring uh, these much needed services further into our community. Um, and that, of course, will allow us to bill and collect under the FQHC status uh, that we, you know, that we uh, so value as an organization. Mm -hmm. uh, with that being said, uh, we're happy to answer any specific questions that you may have. Thank you very much. I'll look first for public comment. Do we have any speakers in chambers or on Zoom, Peggy? We have one speaker uh, in chambers, Paul Soto, and we currently have no speakers uh, virtually. Let's hear our single public speaker. Thank you. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Considering that uh, racism is a public health issue and there isn't, we haven't contextualized that fact within the context of these particular items. And I'm not going, in, from, from now until the day that I can't breathe anymore, I'm going to continue to demand. I'm not asking. This is a demand. And then I'm going to set an expectation that that is quantified. How has racism become a public health issue? And how much has racism impacted these particular programs and the deficits that are created in them? You see, Racial equity, dealing with racial equity issues is not giving Somos Mayfair two, three, four million dollars and think that you dealt with the issue. That's dealing with an employee. Somos is a, an employee of Santa Clara County and the city of San Jose. You still need to deal with the barrios. And I'm a representation of those barrios. I am literally a representation of the historical and generational impacts of redlining and Diaz versus San Jose Unified School District. You see, I still need to talk to Judge Manley because that, that case 
1971, and he argued it on behalf of my community, and he won. And what it was is that Diaz versus San Jose Unified highlighted and articulated for the very first time the consequences of redlining because it manifested in the schools. And then they were able to determine, CDC was able to determine and use that data to determine how many beds they were gonna need in the prison system because of behavioral issues that third graders were experiencing. And you highlighted that in your, in your memo. That all has to do with drug addiction because of the conditions in which these kids had experienced they eventually grow up to be adults and have those issues. Thank you. Thank you, and I understand a speaker has joined us on Zoom. We do have one virtual speaker. Blair Beekman, you're being unmuted, if you could please accept. And your mic Hi. is open. Yeah, great, thank you. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman, uh, thank you for this item. Uh, I think we owe an incredible uh, uh, amount of uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Jeff Smith. Uh, I guess he's retired now. Uh, he used to work a, a, a lot to make sure that uh, there were good uh, rights issues for individuals uh, within the homeless system and, and working within the mental health system. I think the, the things we're trying to balance today, the new questions of mental health and, 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 and how long a person should be in a facility and such, uh, we're balancing that fairly well. Uh, because of the work of, of Dr. Smith. So thank you incredibly for that. We, we, we now have choices, really good choices, I think, in how to address the issue, which makes us interesting and hopeful in Santa Clara County, I think, uh, and a good example, I think, for the state. Uh, so thanks for the work, man. It takes balance. It takes uh, a real good understanding of both sides of the issue to come together, and we're really doing that, I think, with this issue. I've been trying to do that, and I haven't succeeded very well, and you guys have, and it's just nice to see that good example taking place. And um, good luck in our continued efforts to do that. And um, we have to really be considering the rights of, of, of individuals in this process. We can't just develop new systems without them, without considering the individual's part in the process and how they can feel safe and, 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 and they're and like a human being and not treated as cattle. So good luck in that, we're, we're trying to do that again. And uh, thank you again. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much. Do any of my colleagues have comments or questions on the VHHP report? Supervisor Lee. <clears throat> thank you, President Allenberg. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Celine, Paul, and the rest of the team for the hard work on this uh, good report. It was explained that the general information line was created, uh, which also resulted in calls from patients who received written forms of communications. Um, can you um, maybe elaborate a little bit what actually typically happens on these phone calls uh, and all they get redirected to the primary care uh, providers afterwards? Yeah, so my understanding um, is that once they answer these phone calls, they then connect them with the community health worker or the nurse, whoever they're assigned to, and then that person reaches out to the client. Okay. Um, I guess the, these phone calls, is there some type of uh, analysis uh, of these calls and the, some of the summary that we could actually see to see how many get services and how many percent actually, you know, any type of follow-up? I believe example? they're tracking it. Um, Paul, that's correct, right? I believe they're tracking it, but it's too early in the process right now to determine. We don't have data yet. Okay. Do, do you know when we might be able to get that? Uh, Supervisor Lee, what we mm -hmm. can do is when we believe we have sufficient data to report, um, we will be sure to include this uh, in our next or the upcoming report uh, of the Valley Homeless Program. Okay, very, very good. Yeah, and again, I just want to say thank you for the report and uh, the excellent work that VHXP has always been doing. I really very much appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's all for now. Thanks. Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. I I'm just wondering with the, um, with the greater um, patients that will come in through the system, how, what is the plan to augment staff to respond to the need? Uh, Supervisor Arenas, uh, your question, I believe, is focused on uh, the increasing number of homeless individuals that potentially this 
program is serving, correct? And right. what is our plans going forward? Right, right. Uh, so a couple things. Um, one, uh, we, we have been looking at enhancing our staffing relative to shelters uh, in the community. Um, and that is an area that, um, as you well know, we can actually pick up a client that may have not encountered our system and ensure that they receive the ongoing primary care and preventive health services uh, that we can offer as a health system. Um, and I think that's an important strategy going forward. Um, and that's something that we will be reporting back to your board on in terms of what our efforts are and what uh, the staffing model could look like. Uh, the other area that we're focused- I'm sorry, Paul. So you're saying like leveraging the staffing at the shelters as part yes. of that response? So right now we have a, a small team that supports the shelters. Um, and what we're looking at is whether or not it would be advantageous to expand that team ah. to better capture clients and ensure that they're receiving ongoing support uh, from our healthcare system. Right. But it would stand to reason that they're going to be doing some additional work. Um, uh, and so I hope you, you do increase your, your staffing needs there. I know it's one of the um, areas of concern as we all go out into our communities. It's the first thing that people um, have concerns about is what, what are we doing and what are we offering? And so I, m more importantly is what, how are we supporting that community? Um, and so it, it um, I'd hate to see that we're augmenting services, but we can't deliver them because we don't have enough people um, within the system to process uh, the folks who are coming in into the system. Yes, Supervisor, I, I think your points are right on. Uh, one of the areas that we're also working closely with the county executive office is making sure that we're using, utilizing our resources to their full potential. Um, so what we will be looking at is, is how we're providing services, what changes in our workflow can be accounted for so that we're providing the most relative to what resources we do have. I, I really appreciate that. And I, I want to tie in um, a request that I had uh, made previously this year, and, the, and that was the question about and I know this referral is still in progress. It hasn't been checked off just, just yet because I know it's a, it's a heavy lift. Um, my, and my request was for us to figure out how do we coordinate with those city services, especially the city of San Jose, because it, they're the most demanding in terms of um, need. Um, how are we coordinating with their um, homeless site, uh, or unhoused sites, their tiny homes, um, to provide some of the services that we just finished talking about? Yeah, oh, great question, Supervisor Rennes. So we actually do have a monthly meeting um, with Ops of Supportive Housing and all the other um, people within the city of San Jose um, for outreach efforts. So that's kind of a place where we do connect um, what type of resources they're offering, if there's, you know, like you said in Gilroy with the fentanyl um, deaths, you know, if that's happening, then we'll send people out. So we do connect, I believe it's monthly, there's a meeting. So you, uh, you connect with the, the cities and, and do you connect with the schools? Um, how do you learn about overdoses there? Um, we do have a teen van um, within our program that does provide some services to some schools. When you say some services to some schools, so it just—it's not every school in this in San Jose, but we do have a teen van that does provide services to at-risk youth. Am I to assume that maybe these are the schools that are within um, certain zip codes that have challenges like crime and poverty? And okay, uh, it would be wonderful to see what is offered at Overfelt and Silver Creek. Um, especially in my district, I like those are two areas, and and actually the junior high Leva Middle School. Don't know if you go down to to middle schools, but it would be wonderful to figure out, out what that looks like, and we can connect offline for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Did you have additional comments? I'm ready to make a motion. 
Go right ahead. Yes, I'd like to go ahead and make that motion to approve the operational report from HRSA, uh, project director, uh, and also to receive report from the Santa Clara Valley Healthcare relating to engagement outcomes for enhanced care management services, the effectiveness of these outreach strategies, also receiving report from Santa Clara Valley Healthcare relating to type of substance use treatments provided, a level of needs observed by staff, information regarding how implementation occurs in conjunction with Behavioral Health Services Department and other external parties, and also approved the submission of change in scope application relating to supporting documentation to HRSA to add oncology, general surgery specialty care, optometry, and allergy care to those least lists of services. Second. Motion second. Let's vote, Peggy. Supervisor Arenas. Yes. Supervisor Submitian. Aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Item 16 is the video security camera system at a Collective at 1870 Center Road. Your mic's not on yet. Good afternoon, Madam President, Honorable Board, Doug Feliciano, Director of Facility Security, joined by uh, Darren Tan, Deputy Director of Behavioral Health Services. We're prepared to answer any questions about the proposed installation of uh, security cameras at this new location. Thank you. Do we have uh, questions or a motion? Supervisor Simidian. Questions to begin, uh, Madam President. I. Um, uh, I gather and appreciate that uh, the newly updated countywide video security system policy is the one that's in use here that was just, I think, updated and edited a couple weeks back. Is that correct, Mr. Feliciano? Correct. Thanks. Um, let me tell you, and I apologize for not getting this question to you sooner. Um, Oftentimes, when we look at these security cameras, they are mounted outside because we're trying to make sure somebody isn't breaking in. Um, a little different dynamic here. Do I understand correctly that these cameras are, many of them are actually inside the facility, the venue? No, sir. Actually, only two will be located inside. Okay. So those are two out of how many total, roughly? Uh, Fifteen. Fifteen. And then on those two, are they uh, new placements where there haven't been indoor cameras before, or are they um, simply replacing outdated equipment? There's an existing camera system there that has not worked for a number of years. Um, so in the general lobby, there was a camera dome, or there is a camera dome there that's not operating. So we'll probably be using the existing infrastructure and, and wire runs to install there to get the lobby, and then the second place will be an exit door because part of our camera coverage plan is getting stairs and exits and entrances, and that there's nothing existing there. Yeah, let me, um, forgive me, that wasn't terribly articulate. Yes, thank you. Let me ask the following follow-up question, which is, uh, have you talked with any of the clients, the users there, about their privacy concerns inside? I mean, essentially, you know, what we're talking about is, is uh, in addition to providing the security function, which I understand, and I understand it's a desire to protect the people in the facility, but we're also going to have a record of folks who are using the services there, and not all of them may want to be uh, understanding that it's not in private spaces, but their very presence there, um, you know, maybe something that they're not wild about sharing uh, or having recorded in this way. And I'm just wondering if any of those conversations have taken place since we've now got camera or cameras going inside where they haven't either existed or worked previously. We normally camera lobbies, but this has come up in the past, so we certainly um, will look at it as we're in the planning phase. I have not personally spoken to any clients, but um, I'll have Darren speak about that, but we can certainly um, move or not put those cameras in that location or put the camera view in a way that uh, protects more privacy. Thank, thank you, Doug. Um, yeah, Supervisor Simidian, so we currently do have a, um, 
a Q Corner program located at our downtown clinic location, and the um, managers overseeing that program who will also be overseeing this program are, are really engaged with the clients there. And from my understanding, we've heard um, not really concerns about the cameras, it's more uh, about their safety, so I, uh, it's it's my understanding that the cameras are going to be invited by the uh, the clients, but we'll continue to have these conversations as uh, we develop the the site and have it prepared and ready. Mr. Chan, forgive me. Could you give me your job title and who you, which department or agency you work Apologies. with? Apologies, uh, Darren Tan, uh, Deputy Director for Behavioral Health Services. So uh, this is something that doesn't happen that often in real time. So colleagues, what do you think? I, I, I'm, you know, if behavioral health is telling me that the clients in their understanding are, are comfortable with this and, and given the fact that we now have, I think, good policies in place, I'm sympathetic, frankly. I'm inclined to, to move forward. On the other hand, I really do want to be sensitive to the privacy considerations here when we're talking about you know, users, uh, clients in an indoor setting. I, you know, one possibility is that we kick it for a couple of weeks and ask you to come back one more time. Madam President, I see our uh, kind of executive leaning in. Let's hear from James. I would just share a few, few thoughts. You know, we do obviously have uh, a much more protective set of policies, thanks to our surveillance ordinance and the adopted use policy here. Uh, in the context of the alarming increase in targeting of this vulnerable community uh, from hate speech, hate crimes, uh, harassment, and other activity, uh, the lack of infrastructure that would allow us to successfully prosecute or pursue individuals who may wish harm on that community, uh, in in my judgment, which is just my opinion to share with the board, obviously a board decision, uh, outweighs the that modest privacy uh, consideration, given the fact that um, you know these cameras are not in any way in any patient care areas. There's no audio recording any patient care areas or at all. No. Um, and so, you know, in that context and given those circumstances, it would enable us to be in a position to actually pursue individuals if we have, for example, um, activity of folks coming in the lobby uh, trying to block access, inhibit services, or otherwise harass uh, the clients that we're trying to serve. Just some further information. Um, a lot of crime happens outside of lobbies or right through the door, especially when you have an unlocked door. Uh, and this door will probably be unlocked for open flow of services. So that's why, um, as the county executive was saying, we do always, in principle, camera our lobbies for that reason, because we catch very good footage that can be turned over to law enforcement. I think you just nailed the heart of the challenge. Uh, Doug, how, how long do we, if you don't mind, sorry. No, thank you. I, I, um, I invited and welcome it, yeah. frankly. The how long is the footage kept? If we, 90 days. Excuse through the Pass. chair. Slight clarification, 90 days unless there is some legal requirement to keep it longer Correct. for a specific but Then purpose. we can separate it from the hard drive and it's kept forever long as necessary. But our standard for our recorders is 90 days. Is destroy after 90 days? Yeah, okay. it's written over, yeah. Correct. Uh, Supervisor Lee, did you want to add? Yeah, so <clears throat> first of all, I just want to say I'm so excited for the Q Corner's new home, the, the collective. I understand that this move hasn't already happened but I want to how, highlight how important this improved space will be for our county residents who identify as LGBTQ+. The New York Times has reported that there were more than 350 incidents on anti-LGBTQ+, harassment, vandalism, assault in the U.S. from June last year to April this year, a span of 11 months, reflecting a climate in which bias against gays and especially transgender people has become a major problem, as I mentioned rather earlier, passionately earlier today. We need safe environments like the collective and increased support and funding in light of a recent uptick in these type of violences. 
and I'm happy to adopt the findings and improve the activation of the video camera systems to better protect our county residents who will come to the collective in search of these affirming support. I will certainly look forward to making a site visit, so I would like to inform the administration that I'll have my office follow up to schedule a tour. If um, I'll ask if my colleagues, as well as this meeting, would you like to make a motion, or I'll be happy to. I think what I'd like to do, Madam Chair and colleagues, is move the recommended action, which is to adopt the findings and approve the activation, with uh, direction contained in the minutes explicitly, please, that um, the identified parties in the policy um, who have the ability to provide data access, this is page three of six in the policy for the record packet, page 265, be explicitly advised that um, the, the intent here is to limit access so we don't have people just rummaging through for their own personal interest um, and that the, uh, with an assurance from behavioral health that they will raise this issue with um, the clients and ask them how they feel about it. And uh, you know, if you feel like there's something you wanna bring back, you can bring it back. But um, I think uh, we're all mindful of the, the safety concerns and wanna make sure that that's uh, addressed. But I, I do think, um, want to make sure people underscore the importance of privacy protection at the same time. And one of the benefits of the surveillance policy is that we've made the case successfully, I think, that the two aren't mutually exclusive, that we can respect people's privacy and still take care of the security needs. So that was my motion. And second. And I'll say thank you and um, let it go with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have public speakers on this item. We have one cheap, one speaker in chambers and one virtual speaker. The speaker here. in chambers is Paul Soto. Thank you. <laughs> Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, we're going to be able to put this to, to the test. I think there's HIPAA issues, and thank you, uh, Supervisor Submitian, for bringing that up. There are HIPAA issues to consider. They're not minimal. They are federal law. And so that's the one, that's one issue. The second issue is that we're gonna be able to test this. This incident where I was arrested, oh, happened at 1075, right there in the front. So like I said, I want access to those cameras because they're gonna be used in a civil lawsuit. Now I'm not gonna name the county. My issue is not with the county. In fact, the county has been supportive of me. It was Nora Freeman and the mayor of San Jose that called the police on me and demanded that I be arrested there on site. So the county is simply gonna be called as a witness and that, though, that film footage in the front to be subpoenaed as evidence and people that were in the building to be called as witnesses. But I'm not going to name the county of Santa Clara in that lawsuit, I just wanna be clear on that. Those cameras can provide protection in a situation like this for a civil lawsuit. There's been five incidences and I have never been taken into custody, but five incidences when the city of San Jose has tried to arrest me. One time at Conexion with respect to uh, the issue with uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, and then twice at that particular building, twice. Twice I was, there was an attempt to arrest me, but there was no merit to the charge. So when they put me in handcuffs right there in front, what the city of San Jose is doing is trying to force a confrontation hoping I make a mistake, hoping I react to it so that they can either kill me by pulling their guns because they already have a preconceived prejudice against me. There's also a, an implicit bias because this guy is an enemy of the state because of the city of San Jose, hoping that I'll make a mistake during the course of the interaction and that somehow or another I'd be either killed or charged with resisting arrest. Thank you. And our virtual speaker is Blair Beekman, if you could accept the unmute. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you a lot for this item. Uh, having a steady session process between between supervisors and, and, and staff people is important. Uh, I think this item needed uh, public comment first uh, to hear public point of view, and then that can add to your study session discussion. Uh, you guys have made, uh, it sounds like this is a sensitive issue. 
I have serious concerns about the initial uh, re uh, revision of the uh, video uh, camera process in the surveillance policy ordinance practices of Santa Clara County. It sounds like it's, it's made it a way that it's done now in secret. It's done behind closed doors, that it doesn't get an open public vetting. This item is today. So obviously something is important to yourselves and you want to do it well. Thank you. And, and uh, Supervisor Lee has talked about that a bit. I wanted to bring up the issue of biometric uh, camera use. Is that going to be used for this item? And as an item, we have to be clear with each other that biometric camera use is going to be used a lot more in our future. And we have to learn how to have those conversations openly. I fear, I fear that you revised the policy practices in 2021 to specifically avoid talking about biometric camera use in the public space. And this is the perfect time to ask those sort of questions and to make it an open public dialogue. And what you can do uh, in making it open at this time, it develops trust. And we have to learn to make these as regular policy practices to talk about openly and to make decisions about. And for you guys to hide from this issue, I hope you can make it clear this time in all the ways you're trying to do this item well, are, is there biometric camera use going to be involved? And we have to just be open on that subject in our future. Good luck how we can make it a clear conversation. Thank you. And that concludes public speaking. Thank you very much. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. If the seconder is amenable and I don't think it would pose a problem, why don't we also ask for a report back in three to six months from our HIPAA compliance team? Uh, I, I mean, we have cameras in healthcare settings. It's not unheard of. Uh, it does have to be done carefully. But if we could get that additional assurance, I think that would be further um, uh, confirmation that, that uh, we've sort of stayed on it and have addressed it. Is that something behavioral health can manage? Yes, Supervisor Smithian. Then without objection, I would incorporate that into the motion. Yes. Thank you. And thank you. All right. Let's vote, please. Supervisor Arenas. Yes. Supervisor Samidian. Aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Our final item today is item 19, Agricultural Working Worker Housing Report. I'll invite presenters uh, to come on down, and I will look to Supervisor Arenas to take the lead on this item. Welcome, everyone. Would you like us to make a staff presentation before you speak? As you prefer. I'll look to my colleagues. If uh, We provided a, a memo ahead of time, and I think we um, printed it and handed it out personally. So I, um, I, I think if you want to do just a really quick five-minute version, Sylvia, if you have a five-minute version in your pocket, that would be wonderful. Five-minute version, all right. Uh, Sylvia Gallegos, Deputy County Executive, and I'm here with Dr. Marilyn Underwood, who's our Environmental Health Director, and also Darius Hagigi, who's a Program Manager, Environmental Health in the uh, Consumer Protection Division. We do have a report, um, a rather lengthy staff report that responds to the numerous inquiries that were uh, provided to us by the Hewlett Committee. And in the interest of time, um, I'll, let me focus on um, the highlights, which is the recommendations that we propose to you. Um, so in the packet, you'll see on packet page 532, really the heart of what we're proposing to do from a staff perspective, and this is based on numerous conversations that we've had with um, perspective applicants and also the people who are closest um, to the ag community. And just for your awareness, we also have the ag commissioner and our ag liaison in the audience. What we're proposing to do is undergo a permit processing um, improvement effort. 
and it's, it's a very significant undertaking. And we propose to uh, literally reinvent the process, create process flow maps, develop packets that are understandable for prospective applicants, translate it into multiple language. We understand we have, in particular, Chinese and Spanish growers who um, are monolingual. Um, try and reduce uh, the information so it's less technical. Provide um, overlay maps to help people at the outset understand site condition constraints so they can make improved um, business decisions. And we hope will result in more successful applications. That's the heart of it. In my view, um, this is a very significant undertaking. It would be like um, trying to rebuild a plane while flying the plane. So I want to really underscore that this is going to be a very significant staff effort, and we appreciate Supervisor Arenas' efforts to um, help us identify the support we'll need to undertake this. In addition, uh, we continue to recommend, and now as we learned earlier, we're trying to make a robust intergovernmental relations um, team and, and a greater presence both at the federal level and the state. We do propose as well to advocate for e increased funding for both existing and new state programs to help with new housing and also rehabilitation. And we do take advantage of the programs that currently exist. Specifically, I'm thinking of the CERNA program. We also do propose to engage in public-private partnerships. Um, there are some models um, locally that have resulted in success, and we are absolutely open uh, to entertain that in order to you know, draw more prospective applicants and sort of meet that need. There was a request um, to identify legislative solutions. We do propose um, one that could be an example for further exploration with the state as it relates to the threshold we established for very level, various levels of water systems. And you can find that um, proposal in packet page 533. And then finally, um, there was a request by Super Arena, Supervisor Arenas to identify county-owned sites in South County that have the potential for um, possible ag worker housing. And we include that as attachment three in a table. Of the two, um, of the six, I should say, there's two that um, have high degree of potential. As you know, Supervisor, there's the 8th and Alexander site within the incorporated city of Gilroy. I understand from the OSH director that they plan to issue a request for offers um, this next month in order to identify a development partner. And so we think we're well on track to be able to um, proceed with an affordable housing project there. There is a commitment to make some subset of the units available for eligible agricultural workers. The other site I would identify briefly is the San Martin campus. I understand that we're also looking in it, at it for other planning efforts, but there's a number of attributes that make it ideal for further consideration, including the fact that it has utilities there. It's under our jurisdiction. We just created this new anchor project with the Animal Services Center, and so it has a lot of um, important attributes. And probably the most significant is uh, we're about to embark on the planning process for that, and so the timing is imp um, perfect. So with that, um, and with the desire to have a brief presentation, I'll close with those <laughs> thoughts. Please, if there's anything that you want to also focus on, please don't. Uh, limit yourself just to the five minutes I was saying if for brevity um, uh, just to wrap things up but if there's anything else that you'd like to mention Sylvia okay so I, I see you shaking your head no and um, uh, President Ellenberg I'm hoping if the, we have an opportunity to hear from public comment um, so we can get started on discussion. yes let's go to public comment Peggy do we have speakers in chambers or on zoom we have one speaker in chambers and currently have three hands raised in the queue. Great. Let me just remind folks on, uh, on Zoom, if you're intending to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand uh, now. The queue will close when the first Zoom speaker begins, which will follow speakers in the chambers. Thank you. Our speaker in chambers is Eric Potkin.
you can begin. Good afternoon, President Ellenberg and fellow supervisors. My name is Eric Boycon. I'm speaking. I work as a community outreach specialist for the Santa Clara County Library District, but in speaking on behalf of myself this afternoon. Um, I'm here to implore the Board of Supervisors to support Supervisor Arenas' memo on improving agricultural sustainability. Currently, we're experiencing uh, at the national level a housing crisis, but no one's feeling this more than our agricultural workers. Uh, many who aren't fortunate to enroll in a housing program within South County are forced to either live with their, within their cars uh, or in any illegally converted garages or rent a room somewhere. Uh, many are forced um, to even go back to their place, place of residency um, because they are only unable to find adequate housing here. Um, that being said, most of the housing opportunities offered in South County are inundated at the moment, many with 200 to 300 people, families in the wait list, just to show you a bit of the need there. Also, I'm hoping that the Board of Supervisors reaches to the stars here and also considers uh, creating a agricultural resource center in South County. Uh, many of the services that are needed are unfortunately located within San Jose, and I feel it is a huge disservice for many of the folks in South County. Many of the services needed, of course, are mental health and physical uh, well-being checks, transportation, youth resources, and continuing education services. So with that, I hope uh, to count on your support for uh, Supervisor Arenas' memo. Thank you. We do have a second speaker in chambers, Julie Morris. Good afternoon, thank you. My name is Julie Morris and I work with the University of California Cooperative Extension Office as the county's agricultural liaison. Uh, my role is really to help the county implement its agricultural plan, which the supervisors approved in 2018. And I'm just here to, first of all, thank the supervisors, specifically Supervisor Arenas, for bringing this forward. I have seen out in the field, speaking with growers, with farm workers, with various groups related to agriculture that, as you know, housing is definitely an issue. Um, agriculture, as you know, provides so many benefits to the county. In addition to food, it creates open space. It um, creates flood control, as we saw this past winter with these rains. It creates tourism. It's a job provider. But agriculture cannot do any of this without supporting the backbone of the industry, which is the workers. And that includes housing. Um, I think as as a priority of the agricultural plan, if we can provide agricultural housing, not just for single workers, but for families, it will help support agriculture and implement the county's agricultural plan, which has been approved and seen as something beneficial, not just to the farmers, but to the entire community. Thank you. And we have one additional speaker in chambers, Paul Soto. Sorry, just um, we'll hear the speaker, but I want to confirm that you had all of those yellow cards prior to the first speaker beginning. I did not. Okay, let's, we will certainly, we'll, we will hear you, Paul. I just, I will remind um, you, Peggy, as well, that the, the um, practice that I have adopted since January is that when the first speaker begins in chambers, the, the chamber queue, having trouble speaking, closes the same for Zoom. Um, but if I didn't mention it at the beginning of, of this particular series, and you didn't remember, then we certainly will not hold our public to it. So Understood. Please proceed, Paul. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, please, thank you for extending the courtesy. I know I acknowledge it as a courtesy that you're extending. Um, considering I've been here all day, I just it was an oversight. I'm a descendant of farm workers. I'm a descendant of Sasi Puedes. I still have pictures of my father's tent. He's peeking out and there's two tias and I think I've sent these to you via email, um, Supervisor Allenberg. So you're, you're very well aware of the history and the photographic history that I have of my family's legacy to Sasi Puedes. This item was visited, I have it right here on the uh, 16th. 
I believe, we had visited this issue. And uh, I can't play it now, but there was quotes, and I would encourage us to go back to those quotes that the supervisor submitted and it stated. And he said, I give up on this. That's it. I, I give up. I give up on this issue. Uh, boom. He interrupted Silvia Gallegos when she was speaking. And I have it right here. I just played it. So I reviewed it because I have a photographic memory. I can remember conversations and things that happen like that. And so, so I'd like to re cross-reference this with, uh, with uh, Supervisor Samidian's comments during that meeting. And to say that you know, he gave up on the issue and then the next item in this particular meeting was taking monies from Measure A or Measure E, whatever measure it was, to pay for housing for teachers in Palo Alto. The very next item, after he gave up on the agricultural worker uh, housing project, he's taking money that was earmarked to address homeless issues to build teacher housing in Palo Alto. So we will, I want to discuss that. That needs to be talked about because as a, as a descendant of farm workers and as a representation of Sasi Puedes in the Chicano movement, the lowrider movement, and the farm workers movement that stem from that barrio, that needs to be put on the table and there needs to be more respect for the people that work this land. Madam President. Yes, sir. I would like to just clarify, and I'm not sure if Supervisor Arenas will remember the meeting, but just to clarify, the context of the remark about giving up and Ms. Gallegos, you may or may not recall this, had to do not with the larger issue of farm worker housing where I in fact submitted a referral to our board, which I believe was co-authored at the time by Supervisor Wasserman, on this larger issue of farm worker housing where I not only have not given up, but I will continue to be supportive. It was an expression of my frustration, frankly, with the planning department on the use of non-traditional housing, RVs and such, uh, for one-off isolated uses in rural areas where the planning department continued to press on the importance of infrastructure and I continued to press on the issue of flexibility uh, and it was on that rather narrow and limited conversation where I said I gave up because I think the item had been back in front of Housing, Land Use, Environment, Transportation, oh, gosh, at least three times at that point. On the larger issue of uh, farm worker housing, farm labor housing, um, I have not given up. I've never said I've given up. Uh, I will continue to be an ally on this issue. I referenced at the time that I had actually worked on providing farm labor housing in the 1980s with then County Supervisor Anna Eshoo on the coast of Half Moon Bay. Um, and I, you know, I understand that sometimes these things are misunderstood in the moment, but I didn't want it to be perpetuated. So um, I'm, I'm just glad I had the opportunity to clarify that um, distinction. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Supervisor Samidian, and I, I, I absolutely hear your message, and um, I was there, I um, stood with you in your level of frustration, and I think it's only because we know, um, uh, we, and we understand uh, some of the issues that are impacting our um, agricultural workers in more ways than one. Personally, I will also share that you know, my, and I think I've shared this already with many of you, is that my dad was a bracero um, for many years during the war. Uh, as men leave uh, the U.S. to go fight a war, uh, you need additional arms and help. It's literally what a bracero is, is an extra set of hands. Um, Supervisor? Yes. There's still speakers on... Um, Oh, I thought we on were Zoom. done. No, Supervisor Simidian wanted to make a direct response oh my to gosh. the previous And my speaker. apologize to anybody who's waiting because I also thought we were done or would have waited until all of the speakers had been heard, so. <laughs> That's what I get for being courteous to you people. <laughs> Is it all right if, uh, if we Absolutely. Okay, apologies. Absolutely, we'd love to hear from them. Okay, 
Um, and I will as well remind the speakers on Zoom that if you are intending to speak on this item, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. The queue will close when the first speaker begins speaking. And Peggy, let's give it a few seconds to just see if anyone else cares to join. And we are holding at five. All right, then let's have the five speakers. Thank you. Our first speaker is Rebecca. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon, Honorable uh, President Ellenberg and Supervisors. My name is Rebecca Armendares. I'm a councilwoman from the city, city of Gilroy. I'm calling today in support of Supervisor Aranis's memo. As the 2018 report outlines, supportive housing and services are and continue to be in critical need for farm, farm worker families in South County. The need of farm workers was only exasperated by the COVID pandemic wildfires, and most recently, the flooding this past winter that left them without shelter, work, or resources. One of the farm worker families that were flood victims with whom I worked directly were left living in a church storage room for months, despite having over $20,000 in donations due to the lack of low-income housing stock that they were eligible for due to their status as farm workers. I know that it goes without saying to this board that farm workers are strong, resilient, resourceful, and essential. They are survivors. However, their resilience doesn't need to be tested time and time again when we can put resources, services, and structures in place to help them live and thrive. Thank you for your yes vote on this. Our next speaker is Matthew. Please accept the unmute to begin. Yes, good afternoon, uh, President Ellenberg, uh, members of the board. I am Matthew Reed. I'm the Director of Policy for Silicon Valley at Home. Uh, despite the name, uh, we are a housing and affordable housing advocacy organization that works statewide in Santa Clara County. Um, and I'm very pleased to be here to speak in support of this item. I want to first acknowledge uh, the amount of work that staff has done um, including the staff of the Office of Supportive Housing in the last few years to look for opportunities to create opportunities in South County. Um, I also want to support um, and really express our appreciation for the work of Supervisor Arenas and her staff on this item. Um, this, this has been a long discussion um, and what, what it's really going to take, I think, from reading the materials is a level of dedication and commitment that I've heard both from staff um, and in reading uh, the memo from Supervisor Arenas. This is sort of a moment of reckoning, and I think the lesson uh, is shared, um, but it's important to bring it here. The, the needs are tremendous, and it's a time to look for a real diversity of solutions to, to long-standing problems and really hold ourselves accountable to figure out how to get to yes, because these problems are challenging and often um, we, we stop when they get hard and we, we take the no. So this is absolutely an opportunity set, of course, to find solutions, whether they're solutions to codes that constrain housing development by private landowners. The next speaker is Huascar Castro. And your mic is open. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, President Ellenberg and members of the board. My name is Huascar Castro. I'm the Director of Housing and Transportation Justice at Working Partnerships USA. And we would like to voice our strong support for this item and for the recommendations laid out in the memorandum put forth by Supervisor Adanas. We know that Santa Clara County has, is a very large and geographically diverse county, uh, and we must recognize that there is a genuine need to advance farm worker housing in areas such as South County. Uh, we would like to um, thank and commend so many who have done so much work in the past from throughout the state, and in particular here within the county. Um, and we'd like to commend the supervisor for um, picking up the torch and looking to lead uh, and uh, show her commitment to this really, really important initiative. Um, we're excited to see a lot of the work that is set to come forth um, following this item um, through stakeholder engagement and working collaboratively with various different bodies um, and looking at um, successful models 
uh, in other areas, including the Central Coast and San Mateo, as laid out in the memo put forth by Supervisor Ines. Um, we are very much looking forward to continuing to be part um, of the solution and working on in, in critical housing solutions um, for residents of South County and looking for, for folks in further need of farm worker housing. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Sharon Luna. Please accept the unmute. Good afternoon, Supervisors. Uh, I'm just going to comment in regard to uh, this. Um, um, my husband uh, was a farm worker. His father was a farm worker. Um, so I know the importance as far as with having housing. Uh, however, as a member of the San Martin Neighborhood Association and also on the uh, San Martin Planning Advisory Committee, um, what struck me, because I have been attending the meetings, um, since 2018 is the um, areas that the farm worker housing would be put in. Um, we weren't realizing that um, there was a, a memo put in from Supervisor Arenas until we saw this um, packet. And so I'm, you know, questioning as far as um, I appreciate as far as uh, putting the farm worker housing in, but I think that the community needs to know, uh, especially in San Martin, even though the, there are facilities there, that where these locations are going um, so they can have input um, because it is different from what was proposed uh, to the San Martin Neighborhood Association and at SIMPAC. So we would um, appreciate uh, if you could notify the public in regard to this. Thank you. And our final speaker is Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Thank you for the public speakers today. It was nice to hear uh, both Matthew Reed and Waskar Castro uh, speaking on such an item. Uh, and a thank you. Uh, I guess first, uh, a thank you to uh, Councilperson Arenas for asking public comment uh, before uh, supervisors talk about this item. A reminder that I think it's important uh, to offer usually, the usual way to work should be to allow public comment first and then go into uh, supervisor discussion. It seems a better way to work overall. I know sometimes it doesn't work out that way, but uh, for the most part, I hope we can stick to that idea. Thank you for Councilperson Arenas making an point of that for this item. Thank you. And and to also note that uh, thank you to Council, I mean, not to Councilperson Arenas, to Supervisor Arenas for uh, when she was a council person in San Jose, um, she's come a long way and that to be able to discuss this sort of item uh it just it's i'm glad she's working on it it's nice to hear and uh good luck on how you can develop this issue and the future issues of the previous public comment of where uh exact placement of things can be uh good luck in working these sort of things out thank you and that concludes our speakers thank you very much i'll turn back to supervisor arenas thank you um so I'm going to start, I, I was sharing um, that my, my family has a history of working on farms. My dad was a farmer. Many of our parents who've immigrated uh, from other countries are farmers uh, and worked the lands. And my dad actually, my mom and my dad ended up owning and, well, even though they've both passed away, they still own a, um, a farm in, in Mexico and before they um, they died, they did go back to Mexico for periods of time. They would come back and forth, and they actually um, uh, had some crops of, of dried chile. Um, and so they had their hand up being farm owners themselves. And so it's just, um, it, I mean, it's a really tough thing to do as a farm owner. Um, there's so many wells that my dad electrified <laughs> and that he tried to uh, make work um, so that uh, he could have a, a good uh, crop uh, for that season. Um, and so I can appreciate um, kind of both sides, if you will, um, even if that farm was not in the U.S. Um, farming is a difficult uh, passion. Um, that I think some people have, and I, I really want to protect that. Um, 
and and I love that uh, that you, Sylvia, are working really hard at making sure that there is housing available and that there that you're really like you mentioned, you're setting up the table really for um, our farm workers um, and facilitating uh, by streamlining uh, procedures. I mean, just a lot of the things that people don't know about that are, are just happening behind the scenes, but that need to happen in order for us to really facilitate the process. Uh, in, in 2018, you did this survey and the round table with the farm owners. Um, and it, through that, we learned that there's about 700 um, uh, all year round workers, and then about double that amount for um, seasonal workers, right? Um, and, and if I was to guess, that probably is an underestimate um, because that was back in 2018. So I'm guessing we've grown in terms of what our needs are for our agricultural um, workers. And so I, I really appreciate all of what you've done um, already. And um, starting with the, the agricultural plan, and Julie, thank you so much for, um, for, for the support that you provide as well. And, and for all the, the speakers that, um, that have taken the time to actually call in to a board of supervisors meeting. Um, so Eric, thank you for, for being here um, and working with our farm workers directly. Um, that's really important work. Um, and Blair and Paul Soto and Waskart and Matt and uh, Susan, Sharon Luna and, Rebecca, and Council Member Armendariz. Um, I just want to thank you all. You'll bring a, a different perspective that adds to um, this this picture that we all we have a piece of of the puzzle here in terms of what uh, our farm work farm workers um, need and um, and what the solutions are. And I really love the proposals that you have. It's very thorough, 19 page report. I absolutely appreciate it. Um, and I love that you have, uh, that you started out with some lessons learned, and of course, outlining the challenges and going into, um, really going into some of the reasons why some of, uh, some of the smaller um, um, units are, aren't feasible, um, whether they're state or private, um, you really outlined and differentiated those, and so I really, I, I just really appreciate um, what you've put into this report. It, it is really meaningful to me, um, and I know it's, it's really meaningful to all the people that are working towards um, alleviating some of the, the um, pressures that we all have, and the far farm workers have primarily um, for housing. And if we think that it's hard here in a city center, I cannot imagine how it is in um, in farmland, and I, I was in actually I was in Hollister this weekend, and um, I was um, and, and in Gilroy for a, an event with the chamber, and uh, there is a, a local dentist. His name is Dr. Perez, and he was talking to the son of a farm owner. Um, and you know they recognized each other, and they said, "Oh, are you so and so?" And blah blah blah. And and so Dr. Perez, I, I think it's going to be safe to say he's in the 70s. <laughs> um, sorry, Dr. Perez, if you're not, but um, <laughs> but I'm almost safe it, to say it is. And um, and so he said to to this this gentleman. You know, my parents, when they got here in the 40s, we all lived in your dad, your, your, family's, your family's chicken coop. We stayed there, we, we stayed there for, I, I can't remember how long he said, but because they had nowhere else to go. And they worked on the farm. And that was kind of the, the, the deal there. Um, and, and so making the best of the worst is really at, at, at the center, at the heart, I believe, of what a lot of um, migrant workers have to do, what a lot of immigrants have to do. Um, and so 
substandard housing is nothing new. And I know from my own, my parents and the, the um, stories that they share, it is nothing new. Um, but from the 40s to now, it's been some time, right? And I don't know that we're anywhere closer to really solving for this. And, and it's a difficult um, issue to solve, just like the other issues that we talked about throughout the meeting today. We're not going to solve for overdosing. We're not going to solve for all the social emotional issues of the children happening um, that are happening with our children at our school sites, that are happening in our county. Um, all we can do is really plan for the best, um, bring in the partners that uh, are meaningful, and work with one another and really collaborate. And so this is what I'm hoping to do with, with the memo that I, um, um, that I submitted today. Um, and to, today, really, it's, it's about taking what I heard um, from you, Sylvia, and from your team, um, accepting all of those proposals. And, and it's not to say that any one of those proposals is going to be the answer, right? Because we're going to really troubleshoot some of these things and try to figure out which, which is going to make uh, a lot of sense. Um, you know, and you know, one of the things I think we, we coincide in is um, the housing project reference guide that you talked about earlier. And one of our suggestions is also to take a look at, um, and I think it's San Diego that has um, kind of in, this, in the same vein, but not exactly. Um, and this is all so that we can facilitate uh, the development of housing for our farm workers. Um, and these are templates for agricultural um, uh, permitting um, so that somebody can come in and have um, something that's pre-approved and, and just kind of cookie cutter, right? In the same way that you have a guide and you just follow these steps, the, the, these are the ingredients and then you get to, to, to make some housing. Um, if only if it was that easy, right? Um, and I put an easy bake oven it would all be done in 20 minutes. Um, but that's not the way this is going to happen. I know it's going to be a lot of resources. I heard you loud and clear. It's a heavy lift. It's a heavy lift for your team. And I am asking for something really difficult. But I know that you know your way around the county. And I know you know your way around policy. And I really respect that. And that, um, because I know that and because I respect that, I know that together we'll be able to figure this piece out. And both um, your proposals and your recommendations that are included in my, in my memo are going to hopefully really bring some change, um, and some generational change, um, and housing conditions for our agricultural workers. Um, and so I, I won't go beyond this, beyond the, um, what I just said. I, I'm going to read just the recommendations really quickly for you, colleagues, but uh, although I think that you've all read them, I'm asking for a uh, housing work plan. I'm ask, uh, I've already mentioned that I'm taking what, um, what uh, Sylvia has uh, recommended in her uh, report and um, asking her to move forward with it. I'm asking for us to develop a work plan uh, to implement the, the direction from the board um, and have a, a phased approach that will talk about timeline and scope and resources because we want to make sure that we're successful. It, it, um, really, if we don't have additional resources from our county executive uh, dedicated to, to issues like this, then we'll continue to be okay with substandard housing and okay with families living in a chicken coop um, because that's what they're doing. Whether you, we want to admit to that or not, that's what families are doing. I know what they're doing on the east side because I represented them. And there's four, four families, five families in a home. So I, I just can't imagine the, the, the kind of conditions that, they're, that agricultural workers are living on, 
under currently, just to make it work and pr provide fruit and vegetables to all of us. Um, within the recommendations, I'm also asking to have some verbal progress reports to Hewlett Committee as requested by our, our committee on, on periodic um, reports and um, to come back within 90 days to, admit, um, to adopt the following direction. And there's um, some direction <laughs> that I'm just going to really summarize quickly uh, to the administration and county council and it should include the following within the 90 days uh, should include within the work plan and uh, a return in 90 days. And it talks about process, information, and funding strategies. Um, also, congratulations, Sylvia. I know that you mentioned that um, through Representative Zoe Lofgren, you were already working on a uh, project funding request and you're waiting to hear back from them. And so I, I, I really love that. Um, we're also asking for to develop a pilot program to reduce obstacles to private development. And um, there's a couple of um, examples here. Um, I know that county council you had mentioned, there's a project in Salinas, it's, it's, it's a town called Spreckles, and it's exactly what you think it is. It is a little Spreckle. Um, but they managed to develop around 600 units on site. Um, and, and all with this mindset or this framework that you talked about um, earlier, Sylvia, and that's what do we have in terms of resources already in place to really facilitate the development, right? That's what they, they kept in mind. And so anyways, there's a, a number of ideas here um, to explore. Uh, we also have some legislative and partnership strategies that I'm really looking forward to our county council taking a chart, taking the lead, and and um, and coming back with with some proposals. Um, and that and that's it. That's all. That's all. <laughs> that's all, folks. So I make a motion to um, accept the recommendations in my memo and uh, move forward. I will second. Beautiful, thank you. Supervisor Smitting, do you have additional comments? No, no Supervisor thank you. Lee, you have comments? Yes. Thank you, President Ellenberg. So uh, as we all know, the Santa Clara County, being well known about technology in Silicon Valley, it also used to be called the Valley of Heart's Delight. Many has been forgetting that we actually have farms in Santa Clara County because of the high cost of housing, the need for farm worker housing is often not being recognized. I certainly want to thank Supervisor Arenas for this very important referral uh, and all the efforts that's been going on. Many farm workers sleep in their cars, churches, chicken coops, as I just learned, or couch serving with friends, and they are homeless. Along with the housing and basic needs of housing and clean water and sewage, those are so dire. These farm workers all done housed out in Visible Inner County, and I want to thank um, uh, our uh, staff here, uh, Sylvia, and your team uh, for the comprehensive report addressing these issues. And I absolutely wholeheartedly support Superintendent's continuing efforts to highlight and bring in the needed resources for our vulnerable and hardworking community in our farms. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will um, finish that off with with gratitude as well, and. Uh, Supervisor Arenas, this is really profound, and I, I so appreciate the way you wove your personal story and history into this, and, and to imagine having parents who lived in farm worker housing and be in a position a generation later to build that housing is, is pretty spectacular. Um, so thank you for giving the board the opportunity to support you in this work. And let's uh, vote on our final item. Oh, let's first hear from County Executive James Williams. I just wanted to say that uh, as Deputy County Executive Sylvia Gagos mentioned, this is a significant, important body of work that the board is endorsing, moving forward with, that's gonna require uh, prioritizing and making some significant investments. And it's exciting because this is really important and vital for the future of the agricultural community in the county, but much more importantly for the farm workers that we have the responsibility to help take care of and ensure that um, we are dealing with the real substandard housing. You know, we've had 
code enforcement and other issues that have uncovered some really, really horrific situations over the years. And we've gone in and provided supportive services and other things, but those are one-off um, responses that really call for a much more effective framework of response so that there are actual viable alternatives. And I'm excited in particular about uh, seeking partnership from uh, our delegation on potential legislative options that will make some more robust options feasible uh, and enable us to work in partnership with many others to make a real change here. Uh, but this is, I think, an important effort that the board's endorsing today, and we're excited to uh, do our part in helping deliver on that. Thank you so much, um, County Executive James Williams. I really appreciate that. It, it means so much. Um, and I, I also just want to thank you, and I want to thank Greta and, and Tony and and Kavita, um, because you all supported me in one way or another, and so I really appreciate it. Um, and there is a, a whole team behind me, um, but there's one particular person that I want to thank, and that is my policy director, Patrick McGarity, um, because when he goes down a rabbit hole, um, he comes up with a lot of rabbits. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I love you, Patrick, and I love that we work together. Um, and, uh, and, and thank you team and my chief of staff, Nancy Lay, as well as Mariela and, and everybody else who had something to do with our, our work. It's always a, um, a labor of love. So thank you. Let's vote. Supervisor Arenas. Yes. Supervisor Samidian. Aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion passes. Congratulations, I think it's an incredible opportunity for, for so many people. We are now adjourned. Looking for any final words from anybody? All right, we are adjourned.